Hey. Yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O Culture, where we transmit tales from the crypt keepers of yore. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. I am Ryan Peverly, your party host, the apprentice, learning how to master his craft. As always, this podcast is penetrating your ear hole at 528 hertz. That's nothing but pure, unadulterated love dripping down into that ear canal. And things are about to get a bit more intimate because it's time to lay back and settle in for a long, hot, spine-tingling eargasm. And the man with the master plan for building us up to that is the hermetic hermit himself, Mr. Greg Stewart. Greg is a third-degree Blue Lodge Mason and a 32nd-degree Scottish Rite Mason. He's been called a Masonic Bodhisattva because of his quest to return Freemasonry to its esoteric roots. As a devoted student of the esoteric mystery schools, Greg is a firm believer in the Masonic connection to the Hermetic traditions of antiquity, its evolution through the ages, and its present configuration as the antecedent to most present-day esoteric and occult practices. Greg has explored the rites of Masonic initiation through a variety of initiatory systems with the goal of understanding the deeper meaning behind them. In that process, Greg's exploration has converged with mainstream and esoteric religious traditions, rituals of religious practice, and their intersecting undercurrents. Now, on the other side of that journey, the focus of his attention is on how those intersections relate to the Great Work, a subject he explores in a book series called Symbolic Lodge, which looks at the first three degrees of Blue Lodge Freemasonry and brings together aspects of Hermetica, the Kabbalah, the Tarot, and other esoteric and occult fields to help understand the hidden meaning at work in the Symbolic Lodge of Freemasonry. Greg previously maintained a blog called Masonic Traveler from 2005 through 2009, and you can read some of his essays and commentary from that blog in book form published under the same name. Greg also formerly co-hosted and produced the Masonic Central podcast, the archives of which can be found along with the rest of his personal great work on the website freemasoninformation.com. Now before we get into this, it's necessary to point out that Greg was wearing a headset microphone that gave us some slight feedback here and there throughout the conversation. I did my best to clean it up as much as I could for you guys, which meant a lot of extra work and delayed this episode a couple of days, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Anyway, without further ado, let's ado this damn thing. It's time to wax masonically and cast this pod off into the mystical waters inhabited by one of the most maligned and perhaps one of the most misunderstood groups of our generation. Enjoy. All right, Greg Stewart, first of all, thanks for being here, man. Hey, the pleasure's all mine. Thanks for, for having me. Yeah, I'm, I've been looking forward to this for a while now. Uh, I think the first thing that we need to do is construct a foundation here, which I think is a Masonic pun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Freemasonry is a complex subject to talk about. So before we get into some of the more esoteric aspects of it, I have to ask you, what is Freemasonry exactly? Good question. And and depending upon who you ask, you get a variety of different answers. Most will center around the idea of it being a fraternity of men who gather together to go through a specific set of, of rituals in order to provide access, if you will, to an organization that spans close to more probably more than 300 years, but it's actually celebrating its 300th year anniversary this year through the Grand Lodge of England. Uh, and so it, in its simplest terms, it's a, it's a, a social organization of individuals who gather together into this non-religious re- spiritual system of allegory and symbol through moral teachings. That, that is like a, a really complex uh, definition. The simplest terms is that it's a, essentially a social club with rituals that uh, is attractive to individuals who are looking for something deeper than themselves and looking for uh, a group of people in which to associate with of like mind and um, go through this old system of initiation. You know, I came across a couple different phrases in your book regarding Freemasonry and and the different, I guess I don't want to say there are different types of it, but two of the things that I jotted down here were regular Freemasonry and continental Freemasonry. Is there a difference between those two? 
Well, in my head, the the way that I interpret it, so continental Freemasonry is is a term, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, is it, sort of the American way of doing Freemasonry. So American Masonry comes out of Grand Lodge Freemasonry uh, from England, so the United Grand Lodge of England, which which is the foundation of of where all Masonry comes from. Any quote unquote regular chartered lodge gets a charter from a Grand Lodge, which has then a charter from the United Grand Lodge of England. So in in a weird sort of sense, it's a it's a franchise that stems all the way to the home office of England for it to be considered regular. So American Freemasonry has evolved and it still follows that practice with charters, but it's evolved other groups and other associations that are concurrent with Freemasonry, but require a stepping stone of Freemasonry into them. So say the Scottish Rite, the York Rite, Shrine, uh, and so continental Freemasonry, in my eyes, is this sort of mushroomed up evolution of, of what it's become rather than just, uh, a more, I hate to use the, the term meat and potatoes, but just the, the idea of a, a, a Masonic lodge that operates out of a, a specific city or area in England, uh, and with a few additional bodies with it, but without the, growth let's say that's happened here in america so in america it's it's broad you have a uh i want to say the numbers uh, just about a million now still masons uh a big chunk that go into the shrine which is a, another organization that that has followed it parallels freemasonry in the sense of of its its morals and, and what it does but it it operates differently because it functions as a national body so so it does things a little bit differently it has different charities uh and different focus but again, the requirement in order to be in the shrine is that you are a mason, which may or may not be changing. It looks, it sounded like a few years ago that there was some uh, upheaval or or just some change within some states or within a state to no longer make being a, a blue lodge mason of the first three degrees at the local lodge level a requirement in order to be a member. But I, I don't think that's quite caught on yet, and I don't think that that's still as happening as much. You know, I'm a I'm a layman here when it comes to Freemasonry, which I think is another pun. But you mentioned the Scottish Rite. I don't know. I think you mentioned the York Rite, too, and then obviously the Shrine. But could you tell the listeners what the difference is between these different rites? Well, so so essentially they're different membership organizations within the main. So so the, uh, let's start with the Scottish Rite. So the Scottish Rite follows a system that was uh, elaborated and, and fleshed out by Albert Pike some hundred and some odd years ago, under 32 degrees that are this progressive science uh, of Albert Pike's construction, but based on on his studies and his understanding of these things, elaborating on these systems of of masonry itself. So so the, the first three degrees, which aren't really practiced, uh, except for in some states, it goes into the fourth through 32nd degree, uh, with the 33rd degree being the cap. Uh, at the end, which follow these different moral allegorical stories, uh, building out the philosophies of Freemasonry. Uh, the York Rite follows a path that comes out of England. And in that sense, in my understanding, I'm sort of speaking off the cuff here. Uh, it follows a progressive line that, that evolved that leads up to the Knights Templar. And, and there's a few orders beyond that, I believe. But going through the Blue Lodge degrees, becoming a York Rite Mason, uh, which was a branch of Freemasonry at some point, becoming a Royal Arch Mason, and then going up into the Knights Templar, which loosely based on, on the original Knights Templar, if you will. And then the Shrine. So in America, in America, it's the Shrine and Scottish Rite are the, are the predominant secondaries york right also but not as much as those two shrine are the red fez wearing guys and they do a lot with charity so at the time of their founding one of their their main goals was to promote this idea of more active charity and in that more active charity have, have constructed this fantastic system of shrine hospitals that at one point was probably founded by them uh, to a high degree, but that have gone on to become their own independent institutions with research and services provided, uh, much like children's hospitals around the country where they're, if I believe, free of charge. Don't quote me on that. I don't have any documentation for that in front of me, but, but, but essentially they've made these children's hospitals, um, or these hospitals for children, 
accessible to treat things that in the past were were significantly uh, troublesome. That you know, as times moved on, the the ailments have evolved, and so they've gone on to do other things. But they are functioning independent hospitals at this point that the shrine still is associated with, but. I, just, I want to say that they still raise money for them, but I, I don't think that they are independently able to fund them just because the institutions are so large. Is the shrine, is that the the Antioch shrine? Or is that a different uh, organization? Antioch shrine. Is that, that may be a one body. They're, so within each state or territory, there are organized groups that, that govern that area. So the Antioch shrine might be uh, one body. Yeah, that's what it is uh, near where I live here in uh, the Dayton area of Ohio. I, I see the Antioch, you know, temple and shrine just kind of all throughout this area. So that's probably yep. what you're talking about then. Yeah, yeah. And so within within each state and even within areas within states, there there are groups just like that, and they function territorially. They you know they they manage and, and operate into their areas. I probably can't speak to too much extent to the shrine. This, this, that's that's just my general knowledge on it. I did want to speak to a little bit of depth about the Scottish Rite, because I, I think that's probably what most people are familiar with in terms of these different bodies within Freemasonry. And the Scottish Rite's fascinating because, you know, you brought up Albert Pike. Uh, I'm sure people have heard of him and his uh, famous philosophical treatise, uh, Morals and Dogma. I know that this is an important text in the history of the fraternity, but I'm curious how much influence this text has over Freemasonry today. That's a good question. When he wrote it, and this again is my understanding, when he wrote it, the, the book itself was was assembled into this giant tome, and and you can you can buy it on the internet, and you can buy facsimile copies of it, or even reset text copies of it. Uh, or if you wander through and you use bookstore, you'll find them generally on the shelf for anywhere between 20 and 50 bucks or more. They're, they're these red cloth bound books with gold emboss on them for the titles. At the time, the Scottish Rite, when it was organized, as memory serves, was sort of a, a, a loose collection of degrees after the Blue Lodge degrees that functioned, uh, again, and we're talking 150 years or so ago. It functioned as a, as a, subordinate organization of the Blue Lodge, but it wasn't really codified. At the time they approached Albert Pike, Albert Pike, being a big promoter of it, reorganized it to a degree, reconstructed the degrees, fleshed it out with with writing parts and or whole degrees, uh, and then giving his treatise on them through Morals and Dogma. The The information itself has never quite been accepted as gospel by the body itself so so the entirety of the organization besides a few people here and there never put it on the shelf as like this is rule and law you know let me pull it down and quote from here because the text itself in context isn't really meant to do that i know within a lot of conspiracy circles they they point to morals and dogma as being you know this is the book of the freemasons in my opinion it really is isn't it's a great philosophical exploration of the degrees but taken out of context i mean you could read all kinds of stuff into it but it's not until you put it in the context of the degrees themselves that that things start to really make sense into what he's writing uh how it associates or or even with what he's trying to say you know some of the great horrors of pike is you know him calling lucifer the light bringer and without getting too much of that out of context it it definitely is a whoa what's this but in context of the degree and, and what's happening in that particular degree it it's not fair i, I don't think it's fair to try to, to understand it that way in the past i i had looked at it and sort of scratched my head and thought well you know why can't you just take these at face value and it wasn't until i started into some of my own research and workings and, and trying to write and understanding this stuff that the, the works themselves while having fantastic pull quotes and gems and nuggets of knowledge it shouldn't be taken out of context to read as as you know here's this great philosophy that you should follow in this well, you can't unless you have either taken the degree or understand the degree and then try to put the two in parallel to say, OK, this is what's going on here. It's not, you know, here, here, do this, do that. You can't do this or you can't do that. It, it's associations of, you know, at this stage of, of your 
degree evolution. Here's what these things mean. And at the next one, oh, here's what these things mean. At the next one, okay, well, here's what it means now. It meant that then, but this is a new way of looking at it. And and it's not that you didn't understand it before, but you weren't in a position to understand this then until you've gone through it. So that's, I think, probably a fair way to assess how Morals and Dogma and Pike in particular wrote and approached these things. And that they, they, it is not like a, a secret doctrine like Blavatsky. It's, it's morals and dogma. It's, a, it's, it is a treatise on the specific degrees and trying to understand them in context of that degree and, and the vastness of the philosophy that's been put into him. Now, sometimes, you know, the guy would write on and on and on and pontificate and, you know, try to show how much he knows, but he was a smart dude and he pulled a lot of these things together in the age really before obviously the internet but even before you know having access to great libraries or or access to scholars he himself was a scholar he did have he did assemble a great library of texts and and the guy was well read he he had absorbed a lot of this information and let it seep into the bones of of morals and dogma i feel i i mean it's a fantastic text it's dense and it's rich and if you try to soak it in one page after the other your eyes will go across and and at the end you'll just you'll be bloated and and discontent after having done it but it's something you have to marinate on you have to read slowly and put it into context with the degree and and what would happen and so when the book was originally put out it was put out and given to scottish rite masons who would go through these degrees and when the, upon their completion they were given this book cap and, and all the other stuff that goes along with it with the in hope that they would go home and then read it so okay you've gone through these degrees and now you can read up on what they're about I, I, anecdotally i've heard stories that those books that the the most use that they got was to serve as door holders so you know to hold a door open because it was so much information, because it was so rich, uh, it was just hard for mass consumption. So, so the book itself is important for what's inside of it. But I, within Freemasonry, I wouldn't say that it's had the, the sway that some on the outside and conspiracy circles like to think that it has. Yeah, you're talking about um, the degrees, and there seems to be a link between the 32 degrees of the Scottish Rite and the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. Could you touch on that? So, you know, well, <laughs> not knowing what was in Pike's head, I think I think that as you start to look at some of these symbolic things, these parallels start to show up. And and even within the Scottish Rite degrees, but they don't they don't lean into these very heavily, and they get to it uh, in the fourth degree within the practice only superficially. The system itself, in my opinion, was constructed under that that very idea. So, so the ten sephira and the what is twenty two paths to construct the tree of life. Uh, and as you start to follow the degrees, you move from from sephira to path to sephira and, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the tree, eventually trying to to understand all of these. So, so in kabbalistic practice, so so a non masonic practice so in the true system of where these are you know so so in the sense of of meditating on these as particular paths in which you can go into and study and and exist in within freemasonry it's more here are the philosophical step stones between each and and you can still apply those other non-masonic practices to the degrees but i i don't know how much of a service that is in the sense of trying to understand them in this context so so what i mean is that as you go into the first degree and try to understand the symbolism of it and the parallels within this tree of life uh schema the parallels are there but it doesn't necessarily mean that you know you're meditating on on this foundation and and you know the all the things in these other systems apply to it 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 has its own specific take within Freemasonry. So, so as Pike constructed this, it followed, I believe it followed that process and, and the practice says that it did in order to impart those different aspects as the initiate progressed. Yeah, I was just curious about that because when you read and study the Kabbalah, it does sort of seem to parallel a lot of other teachings of mystery schools and esoteric organizations like the Freemasons. So it was just interesting. 
I, I didn't know the connection between that and the Scottish Rite, obviously, before I read your book, but it, it's not surprising, you know, because there was these lessons and knowledge that were handed down, you know, orally or written, you know, for centuries, right? So it just makes sense that it would seep its way into Freemasonry. Absolutely. And strangely enough, they, they're within these systems, uh, either of occult practice or, or these esoteric schools, they, there's been this, this need or desire to try to bring into them these, these older practices. So, so almost in a syncretic fashion, trying to weave these ideas of Kabbalah into it and other teachings as well, but, but weave it into their practice, either in order to legitimize it or because whomever was the author of it at the time found some great affinity with it, brought them in. So again, like, so with Pike, you know, reading through the text and, and you start to understand how he's connecting the two, even though he's, he's bringing it in, it's still not so overt that it's, you know, here's what you need to know or here, here's how it applies. So, you know, in, in what would be like a common explanation today of like, this means that and this means this. It's subtle. It's way more subtle than that. And, and this is true of other mystery schools and, and esoteric teachings as well. You know, some are more overt. If memory serves the, like the Golden Dawn or the OTO where it's, where it tries to parallel it in a much more firm way, this is in masonry how it's evolved with Scottish Rites. So the 32 degrees, the, the paths in Sephra, the 33rd degree, which strangely enough, then now you start getting into Christian mysticism with, you know, when Christ perished on the cross, 33, you, you know what I mean? So, so there's a, a lot of, intangible parallels here at work here trying to to validate and construct this this like I said, the schema of esoteric study which yeah, which oh. underpins itself and at the same time mystifies as you go through it and and once you get to the end it, it's well it's a very long process very few ever end up to the end of it but at the end presumably you're you know this all-knowing being Let's stay on that for just a second. You know, we're talking about the ties that Freemasonry has to other esoteric groups and organizations. And we've already talked about the Knights Templar. You'll see that connection in, in popular culture a lot. And you'll also see a connection to groups like the Rosicrucians. But the influences of Freemasonry are a bit more complex and in some cases are much older than these groups. I think listeners may be surprised to know how far back the morals and dogma of Freemasonry actually go and, and what they're composed of. And you've written about esoteric Freemasonry and ideas and principles that came from Gnosticism, Hermeticism, and other various mystery schools that were absorbed into Freemasonry. I was curious if you could share with us what ideas and principles from these schools specifically that you're referring to and how Freemasonry was built around them. I think, it, okay, so so at its simpler, at the simplest of senses, in the terms of Gnosticism, so, so the ideas of knowledge, uh, the ideas of gaining wisdom and understanding by wisdom, and, and not just rote belief. In the senses of hermeticism, in, in, the, in the sense of, of initiation, of being a, a craftsman to build in parallel with, with the divine and understand, and, and this is part of one of my interpretations, in, in that sense of empowering oneself as a divine being to, to have your ability to create. Those in particular... I think that, that systems have evolved with these as Freemasonry goes. Intentional or unintentional, it's almost impossible to say. I, I think it, 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 in its earliest fashion that Freemasonry wasn't about these things, that it probably began through the stonemason guilds or, or similar guilds, not necessarily the stonemason guilds, but guilds all the same. Uh, and over time began to fetishize, if you will, the, the, works that they were undertaking and and then bring them into their practice so in the third book you mentioned the two books that i had in the third book that i'm working on right now uh it touches on some of this in the sense that that mystery plays were a tremendous influence on these early guilds in the sense that uh they functioned sure they would cut stone and and do whatever other trades that they were doing within their local areas and it, either as recreation or as part of their community service or just in part of this ritual play pageantry that would take place throughout England, they would adopt these plays of, of a biblical or philosophical 
parallels in order to entertain or convey the message and so on. I mean, it's impossible to say that, that you know, which guild did what. The, the records on a lot of these mystery plays exist, but it's not, it, it doesn't have the encyclopedic cataloging that would happen today in the sense of documenting, you know, who did what, where, and when. But we do have histories of these mystery plays taking place and and the the specific guilds doing specific things. Uh, I don't have anything in front of me that I could pull right now as a reference, but essentially, let's say you'd have in this example, the the Masons Guilds or the Marblers, who were the ones who cut stone, doing these mystery plays on Solomon's Temple. And so as time progressed, the pageantry would progress, and these symbolism would begin to seep into that and start to affect the writing. And so as time moves on, people start studying more into it, finding other parallels, connecting, and so on and so forth, into about the time that we get to Pike and earlier writers and even later writers who who fetishize it even more and romanticize it and then construct these systems uh not to say that these systems didn't exist in some fashion prior to that 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 you know there weren't judaic scholars who studied the kabbalah or rosicrucians who came out of the the early writings of rosicrucianism and people following these things but as time has gone on these western mysteries have have evolved and and begun to seep into one another where they've adopted or dropped cut added uh different aspects in in either in ways to legitimize themselves or just in finding parallels with it in the sense of oh that's what we're doing maybe this fits not in all senses but i idyllically maybe or or just in in wanting to have affinity with it and so then as freemasonry has gone on and in this very simple uh not super esoteric sense other groups have come up such as the golden dawn that borrowed these systems and then elaborated further on it founded by mostly masons again with the oto as well they founded by masons evolved into the fashions that they have and then as you start getting into the 20th century where different groups, Rosicrucians would come up or the builders of the Adidam, writers who, who would take from these ideas and, and evolve up their own. Again, thinking that they were unique and doing something original, but, but still borrowing from these older traditions. So again, back to the, the idea of it being a syncretic system, they, they were evolving these ideas into new ones, keeping some aspects, discarding others and creating different understandings of them. And so that's how this this melange of of esotericism and the Western mystery tradition, I think, has evolved. Manly Hall, early in the 20th century, writing on this, captured a lot of that in his study of it, right or wrong in what he was saying in, in much of him, but still trying to construct an idea of what all these systems have, have evolved into, where they came from, you know, in some sense pulling back to Egypt or to Mesopotamia or, or what have you. But but still, I mean, th- these are sort of a Western phenomena. These, this is the Western evolution of a lot of these ideas into these non-traditional spiritual traditions of trying to find oneself and trying to evolve human understanding and human conscious. Well, when it comes to the influence of, you know, things like hermetic magic and, and alchemy and alchemical thinking, you cited guys like John D, Cornelius Agrippa, Paracelsus, Francis Bacon, uh, Giordano Bruno as influences on Freemasonry with their writing and their work. Are these figures revered in Freemasonry at all? Is their work taught to Masons or does the fraternity encourage the study of their work? On the surface, no, they, they're not. They're, they're sort of these dark, not dark figures. They're not really promoted in the sense of like, you know, here's a list of people to go read. The, these are sort of the, the secondary, even tertiary figures, uh, in the history of Freemasonry that whose writings have contributed in some sense of the, the changing understandings of the time, which likely allowed those thoughts to seep into the fraternity. So, so Freemasonry itself sets itself as a 300 year old fraternity and their anniversary being this year with the United Grand Lodge of England. Records go back even further to, to place Freemasonry. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but about a hundred years maybe before that record wise. So, so the likelihood is that it stretches back even further back into, to the, the 16th century or so. 
and probably even earlier than that, when we start getting into the stone guilds and, and the associations of individuals gathering together to, to practice some sort of activity like that, or to, to have non-traditional or who, who had this non-religious spiritual intercourse like that. And so that's where figures like John D come in or Agrippa or Paracelsus, uh, or even the translations of the hermetic texts that, that happened under the Medicis. When, when the Medicis got their hands on these texts, they realized the importance of them, had them translated. They stopped translating philosophies, put these texts first, uh, with, uh, Ficino, I believe. And that's when they seeped back into Western Europe and, and the ideas began to permeate back into this underground of thought. And, and we're going back now to the early Renaissance. So these ideas, Again, it, it's there's not like a stack of text or people that you could say this influenced that, this influenced this, to this, to this, to this. I, I've tried to to draw these parallels. I've I've created a try to create a timeline or a, a spreadsheet of some kind to to understand what this progression has looked like, and and it's a mess. It's all over the place because the ideas and the people seem to come in from so many different sectors, but. You know, one person reads a book here and it influences their writings later. Another person reads a text here and it influences their writing there. It's not a clean lineage of this to that to this. You know, it's not like we could say with Da Vinci's flying machine that there's a clear path. I mean, there's not really a clear path, but it's not like there's a, a direct clear path to Kitty Hawk and to the space shuttle. You, you know what I mean? There's a lot of meandering, a lot of different uh, attempts or tries at, at different things with different outcomes that, that led to different things. So, so in particular, what I'm referring to is like, say the Rosicrucian lines, the, with the, with the Rosicrucian writings, the 1500s or so led to, to different ideas and different understandings. Not to say that Freemasonry didn't borrow some, but it's led to its own thing with organizations that have come up in the, the subsequent centuries, such as a Mork or other Rosicrucian groups who, who dropped paths back to those original writings but have adopted or evolved different ideas of them yeah you know and that's and, where, where aspects of magic and these other sort of spiritual practices come in you know even even to take like say alistair crowley alistair crowley understood a lot of these things and evolved these ideas through his works and and i am by no means an expert of, on him but just in in reading his works and his understandings and and his biography to see how these things influenced him and influenced his thinking you know it started with an idea and you evolve that idea and you read more and you read more you know there's no great like the movies there's no great epiphany one day of like suddenly i'm a i'm a an occult magus with unlimited knowledge i mean it, it that just doesn't happen so these things begin in slow progression step by step with with subtle subtle understandings that evolve through time that that evolve through writings and through publishing you know it's different it's interesting to see what'll happen in the next 50 to 100 years with the internet and the and the profusion of, of information to see if these things solidify into to more significant organizations or if it just becomes so diffuse into the the common knowledge of the public that a lot of these groups just sort of evaporate into philosophical ideas that that have come and gone yeah for sure one of the parallels that you draw in your work is the sort of similarity between the degrees and the alchemical process of creating the philosopher's stone and that idea of, of creating this stone has been around for eons it seems whether it's a physical object created during a, an actual scientific process or something that relates more to you know mind and spirit which is I think where Masonic thought is when it comes to alchemy. You actually describe this alchemical transformation in Freemasonry. You say, uh, quote, there is no philosopher's stone created, nor a transformation of lead into gold performed. Instead, what the alchemy of Freemasonry strives to make is the transformation of the untamed, rough, individual man towards a refined and controlled stone contributing towards the betterment of his self and in course fitting into civil society. And that's a great summary of what freemasonry is really all about i i would say that's probably true of, of a lot of organizations but but thank you very much please feel free to go on <laughs> <laughs> I, I i mean so as you start to get into these ideas th there are certainly individuals out there who who have taken alchemy to very far reaches timothy hogan is is one who who's a sharp guy and and has spent the time in trying to uh, create these transmutations, these alchemical transformations of one thing or another of, of physical tangible things. 
uh, there's certainly no doubt that that a degree of alchemy exists in the ferment of chemistry, which which is an evolution out of alchemy. So so that is a science that exists in the sense of trying to create mythological powered things to either promote longevity or eternal life or, or something of the like. I mean, the, these to me are, are allegorical stories that are trying to inculcate what I said in that quote, this idea of transformation, because in that process of trying to create this, certainly there's going to be change in, in the properties that are going into it. In the sense of, of tangible changes to the individual, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a horrible cliche, but an opening of the third eye to, to understand the, the changes at work. And then once you're through that, to have this change of, of personality, I, I am a different person having undergone these things. You know, that, that when you started, you, you weren't the same, you weren't the person that you were downstream because of your experiences with it, because of the things that you've read or the things that, that you've looked at and tried to understand in, in your own head. That, it, that it, it's one thing to try to find the parallel with, with this real and physical search for this philosophical philosopher's stone with it being this inner transformation you are trying to create that within yourself you are trying to create transformation which is at the the heart of of freemasonry it's, it's this process of coming in this rude and uncut state and becoming a person who tries to do better a person who wants betterment for society a wants a person who wants betterment for themselves for their associates and who strives for those things now whether or not the the day-to-day operations of a lodge or of masonry itself functions like that's another story but the individualized personalized take on these things is essentially what's happening you're coming in uh, as a as a neophyte and you're leaving as a master I, I don't know how you could have any other outcome at the end besides being transformed by calling yourself a master yeah, I think it's important to note too that you know we're talking about mastering yourself, and that's the ideas that are you know evident in you know Gnosticism and Hermeticism. It's it's all about acknowledging the presence of a divine being inside of you, and not having to rely on you know an intermediary like a priest to attain you know a connection to that. It's already inside of you, and that's I think the the important thing to note here is that these teachings are, are no different than what you hear in Gnostic and Hermetic thought. You wrote that this is not a path to a celestial home, but how we can attain a connection to it, and that's I think that encapsulates everything that that, that we've been talking about here. But this does beg a question for me: Do Freemasons have a certain cosmology of the universe then, or any beliefs on how humanity was created, or what our purpose is here on Earth, or is that just part of the personal belief system for each individual Mason? The the system itself d- does not have like a trying to think of the word here does not have a statement of faith so so you know where you do, if you walk into a church uh, a lot of times they'll advertise what their particular church's statement of faith is you know like we follow the nicene creed we follow the blah 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 it, it, there's nothing that exists like that for most masonry it, the requirement of admittance is simply a, a belief in a supreme being call it god uh there, there's a a strong aversion to to let's say agnostic or atheist thought. So if you came to it and say, I'm an atheist and I don't believe, but I want to be member, the likelihood that of your getting in would, would be probably slim to none. But for the individual who recognizes Supreme being in most States and most places, the, there will be no test as to what that is. Uh, so, you know, you could believe in the flying spaghetti monster, I suppose. And, and insofar as you don't try to tell people or try to convert them to belief in the flying spaghetti monster, there probably wouldn't be any issue. I, I mean, I say that tongue in cheek. Mm-hmm. In the subtext of Freemasonry, though, there is a very pervasive idea of all religions being acceptable. Uh, because again, if you were to, to go up to a lodge and, and whether a Christian, a Hindu, uh, uh, a Muslim, a follower of the Jewish faith, he, 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 I mean, it takes in individuals of all faiths. And so in that sense of taking in individuals of all faith, being a spiritual organization, in my opinion, creates almost this spiritual bubble around it of all faiths. And 
I think in my eyes that that's where we come back to these ideas of of a hermetic teaching in the sense that if if it's all faiths being under this one true religion, something that Pike in Morals and Dogma oftentimes brings up and mentions and and weaves throughout. You know, I just pulled off of my shelf a copy of Hermetica and just flipping through in one of the places that that you know I've both highlighted and underlined and in one spot underlined uh, each word four and five times saying, uh, and this is a quote coming out of uh, Hermetica. This is out of the, the 12th Discourse of Hermes Trismegistus, where it says there is but one religion of God, and that is not to be evil, which, I mean, in a sense, is what Freemasonry teaches. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's very big on this idea of the golden rule of do unto others. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and so and as you start to look through all these different faiths that, all these different faiths have that very same or very similar phrasing of that same rule. You know, again, intentional or otherwise, this it's it's a it's an interesting creation within the system that has fostered for itself this ideal, whether intentional or not, of being this sort of organization, and yet stuck in an idea of itself as being a a probably a Christian organization, but not really a Christian organization, but having the morals and tenets of all these others. So, I mean, in particular, you start looking at, at Freemasonry as a practice and, and it holds, it reveres uh, Solomon's temple very strongly. Well, Solomon's temple obviously is in the Bible, but it's also in the in the Judaic text. You know, it's an Old Testament reference. So it's less about a modern new covenant as it is about older tradition. So again, we're, we're dealing with syncretic issues here that I that are at odds with itself within the organization to reconcile it, but at the same time embracing it fully by its very existence. Yeah, you do make a distinction, I, or, or not not you necessarily, but Freemasonry does make a distinction between religion and faith, and I think that's what we're talking about here uh, in a nutshell, is that you know, Freemasonry is not a religion. They accept all faiths. They don't force you to believe in anything. So I don't know if it's a common misconception, but I know it is one of the misconceptions that people have about Freemasonry, right? Absolutely. And, and not a, not a, I, you know, I, I've, I have struggled with many of folks on this over the years in the sense of, uh, is it, isn't it? I'm in the camp to say that it's perfectly okay to call it a religion. That, that it's, I, I think people fear it because of by doing, by calling it a religion would alienate those who are part of it and who are, are very, affirmed in their own faiths and 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 it would run afoul of that and so as a philosophical organization it it cannot embrace that i just I, I, it just can't because it if it did then anybody who followed another faith would look at it and say well this is you know this is apostasy i can't be a part of this and so as an organization it doesn't so so in a weird sense and and actually in in one of the books that you'd mentioned that it uh and i've posted this on freemason information all over the place but free, freemasonry is almost like a religion of not being a religion so so it's a, a religious practice uh with all the trimmings of of tradition and ceremony and, and even philosophy, but without being a religion in the sense of telling people to pray to this, to burn a calf for that, or to take penance for doing this. So, so it's, it, it, it would be hard to justify it as a quote unquote religion, but it certainly flirts right at the edges with it in, in a lot of different ways. And, and like I said, in the practice, in the tradition, you know, even as you start to to deconstruct the word religion, it's it's the bringing forward of past traditions. So you know that that's essentially what's being done here. You know, the ceremonies and and the rituals that are being practiced. Yeah, and I mean, although the the term religion has been kind of you know perverted over the past few centuries, it seems just because of uh, it seems like you know anyone can start one. And, and get a, get a tax ID for it, you know, so it kind of waters down, you know, the actual meaning of it. That's just my take on it. Well, um, I don't think you're right. You know, not to, to quote pop culture here, but, uh, if, if you've ever watched John Oliver on HBO's, uh, last week tonight, it, at one point, I believe in the last season of, uh, 2016, he founded a religion. 
he, no joke, actually, I mean, the, the process isn't that hard. It's a little bit of paperwork and, and just to, to mm-hmm. assemble a following of some sort. But with the idea in that program to, to be able to collect donations, I mean, it, it was tongue in cheek the entire way, but it showed the simplicity of this process and just the disdain maybe for, for the, for the true working of religion. So, so yeah, I mean, anybody could found a religion. You and I, we could finish this call and we could say, Hey, let's draw up a, a rough constitution, form a, a nonprofit and, you know, we'll call it the occult church and boom, start being able to take donations and hold services and have people hang out. I mean, it, it stranger things have happened. So, so in that sense, Freemasonry exists and, and it doesn't, it doesn't want to go down that realm because I think of, of the implications of doing something like that. Of Not that it wants to skirt the responsibilities, but, but to hold those responsibilities in the sense of, of functioning in that fashion that it would probably suffer the same fate as many religious churches today and, and just become anachronistic. What's the word I'm looking for? It would become an illusion of what it was trying to be. Anachronistic, I think, is the word I was looking for. It would become anachronistic in the sense of its function, trying to continue doing something that just wasn't as contemporary anymore. I don't know yeah. if I'm making any sense with that. Yeah, you absolutely are making sense. I saw a quote somewhere. I think it was like a, a stand-up comedian or, or something. And he said something about like religion is just a cult with better leaders, something like that. I probably <laughs> butchered that quote, but yeah. You know, you mentioned you pulled out a copy of the Hermetica, and we've been talking about, you know, Hermetic influence on Freemasonry. There's actually a long tradition of Hermetic philosophy in America, which dates back to the founding of the country. And we've been told that many of the country's founding fathers were Freemasons, which seems to elicit a generally negative response from people who see Freemasons strictly as a nefarious group. But, you know, like as we've been talking about, the the principles of Freemasonry, which are essentially similar to the principles of Hermeticism, are not nefarious at all, unless you're the Catholic Church or a group like that, I guess. But I did want to outline briefly the seven hermetic principles that play a role in the degrees of Freemasonry. So if you could, could you share what those seven principles are and how they fit into the fraternity? I can, and and let me preface this first, that this is an idea based on uh, another text, so so not... uh, typical uh traditional hermetic text but actually a uh a a later addition to the hermetic philosophy by the three builders uh it's a book called the kabbalion and and most people who who have been in this pool of esoteric thought have heard of the kabbalion you could find it online for very cheap on amazon and and most occult type styled bookstores, but it's still a treasure when folks come across it for the first time and, and, and are taken by it because of, of what it talks about. So, uh, you asked specifically what they were and, and in the text of, that I wrote under Masonic Traveler, uh, the seven principles are the principle of mentalism, the principle of correspondence, the principle of vibration, the principle of polarity, the principle of rhythm, the principle of cause and effect, and the principle of gender. Uh, and each of them are, are fairly true to what their titles are. I won't get into the, to the meat of it. I'll, I'll let others either try to dig it up and, and read it or certainly go out and get the book. But really what these are trying, what this, this particular section of the book and what this text is about it is, is finding parallels within Freemasonry as to these, uh, specific sections of the Kabbalion. And what you could take away from it as a student going either through the degrees or just in trying to understand them from an esoteric occult, if you will, point of view. I should add that the Kabbalion was actually written by individuals who were Freemasons, if I'm not mistaken. Paul Foster Case being one of them. Uh, and then a couple of others, I believe it was uh, William Atkinson's and Michael Whitty, who, who won Whitty from the Golden Dawn. Uh, as well as Atkinson's and, and Case being the founder of Builders of the Adidam. Uh, both the organizations still going on today. Whether or not they're going strong is another story, but still in existence. And, and both with very unique takes on this sort of Western mystery tradition. So, so with, with these seven principles, uh, essentially to, and I'll pull this from memory, but 
down the line. So the principle of mentalism is essentially the the strength of mind and in, in having thought to, to create. Uh, let's go back to the list here. Principle of correspondence, how one thing relates to another. Principle of vibration, how one thing reacts to another. So the vibrations between the two, you know, positivity generates positivity, negativity generates negativity. Principle of polarity, the opposites of things on a spectrum. So, so positive to negative, how they can flip, where they interact. Principle of rhythm, that is how those two things interact and, and, and associate with one another. Cause and effect. Obviously, cause and effect. You push something over, it'll fall over. If you start an action, it puts that action in motion, which will then result in whatever your outcome is that you put the effort into. And then the principle of gender, which gets into a, a very touchy subject, if you will, for, for a lot of individuals, especially with Freemasonry. But it talks about the the, the gender being both a, a male and female at work within systems, within people. So, so essentially we as individuals, a male has female principles in them and vice versa and how those things come out. And it doesn't mean, you know, you, you necessarily fall into the cliches of, you know, sensitivity or uh, maternalism or, or, you know, of the like, but it certainly is, is an understanding and it, it, maybe in a more philosophical way, it's, it's about trying to understand things from a different perspective or, or that ability of, trying to relate to something in the sense of the thing it's placed in the planet and and the spiritual heavens and so on just in in masonic sense it it in something that i wrote back when i put this down on paper is is that it's the the work between the labor of the lodge and the ritual so so it's the the form and the function if you will so that would be one way of taking gender I hope I didn't like butcher these for anybody who comes back and say, you didn't say any of that in this. <laughs> but I mean, that, that in a nutshell is, is, is what these are about. I mean, and this is interpretations out of the Kabbalion. I, if, if anybody listening has not ever read the Kabbalion, I recommend it. It's, it's probably one of the few go to books on my shelf as, as just sort of a spiritual, not primer, but just sort of a spiritual, I need to uplift. Let me pull some passage out or read something and just try to see if I can pet myself up. Yeah, I actually have two copies of it on my bookshelf because I have like a very uh, conspiratorial view on publishing these days, but I'm always interested if ancient texts get, you know, kind of reinterpreted somehow when they're published, you know, as new editions. So I bought an older version and I bought a newer version. I want to see if they were any different and... They don't seem very different to me, but uh, I do kind of question, like, when things are published long ago and then they're republished, you know, now in, in more modern times, I just wonder if there's anything changed, and if so, what was changed? Because it does seem like, for example, the hermetic connection here, the, the hermetic principles and philosophies that we've been talking about, it seems like they sort of disappeared from mainstream culture when not that long ago, everybody knew what they were. Scientists, philosophers, they all studied this stuff and, and believed in it. And I was wondering if, you know, I brought up the Catholic Church earlier. Do you think that the the Catholic Inquisition or any other sort of group maybe played a role in deliberately squashing these principles and their connections to groups like the Freemasons? I, I don't know if I would say deliberate. They, they, there's a there's a weird intentionality behind saying deliberate. I also don't know if I would say that that these ideas w were uh, whole cloth accepted as as being uh, right and true, or or even as being uh, fundamental. I think within certain segments uh, of particular followers of these things, that that there was a degree to which. They, they were philosophically followed, you know, not in any rote practice, but just in general principle. So, so I guess the, the first thing to say to that is that I don't think that these things were ever like the bread and butter of daily life. Uh, as to the Catholic Church, I, I, I will say that obviously the Catholic Church is in the business to be the Catholic Church and, and they will do at various times what's in their power to change uh, things that either may be a threat to them or that are a threat to what they see as their dominion of power. I mean, just looking at some of the the encyclicals on Freemasonry is to to I think it was Human Genus that that talks about Freemasonry being a syncretic organization that that adopts all these other ideas and weaves them into the work. 
so in that sense, I think that they, they, they have stepped in to try to dictate or exercise some authoritative control on it. But, and this is, with this, this has, this is an opinion that's come to me late in this understanding. As much as they've done that, they're, they're not doing that for the broader public. So it's not like they're trying to influence these ideas to, you know, the, the lay person or the Gentile in the street. They, this is for people within the Catholic Church who obviously already follow its practice and tenets and influence their opinions on aspects of, of either these uh, esoteric or occult practices, of Freemasonry in particular, or even of science. I mean, just look at some of their early works in trying to suppress aspects of science, things that we take for granted today. You know, the Earth traveling around the sun and the sun moving, blah, blah, blah. You, you, you know what I mean? So so just in those scientific ideas in trying to exercise dominion and control over them. So so I think within the sense of, of their trying to influence it, maybe at those times there were a greater number of Catholics in society, and so by trying to influence their thought, they were trying to influence a greater swath. I mean, maybe that's probably a, an argument that could be made, but I, I don't think that they, I don't think that they exerted that sort of control and authority over society, at least not for a very long time. Go, let's go back to Paracelsus, who was burned at the stake for these sorts of philosophical ideas. Then maybe, you know, they had a lot more control. But in the more, you know, contemporary or current times, you know, at least the last couple hundred years. I know the Catholic Church doesn't really like Freemasonry, and, and it's denied the Eucharist to, I believe it's the Eucharist, right? They, they've denied the Eucharist to um, to Freemasons. But if you talk to, to regular guys who are Masons and go to Catholic churches, they ask their pastor, and the pastor says, I don't care. You know, so, so I mean, it's, they, there's no lock and step in how these things are practiced. You know, you don't have Catholics marching up to Masonic lodges and throwing firebrands or spray painting, you know, Masons go away. You know, you have other people doing stuff like that or doing stupid things like that, thinking that Masonry is some evil body. But, you know, that, that's a whole nother story. And I, I don't think that any of that's associated with this sort of organized religious practice, not coming from the Catholic Church now. Well, that's a fair point, man. You know, yeah, I didn't mean to come off too conspiratorial there, but just no, no, no. <laughs> if history has taught me anything, it, it is that you just said this too that they, that they have tried to exert their power and influence whenever possible. So, and you talked about burning at the stake. Bruno was burned at the stake for very similar ideas. So I was, you know, just kind of made me wonder if, if maybe during the Inquisition, if they didn't just try to stamp out, you know, these Hermetic principles in Freemasonry, but. That would not have been the entire purpose of the Inquisition, obviously, but I just thought maybe it wasn't just a, a byproduct of it. But transitioning to something else, I've seen mentions of an Egyptian rite of Freemasonry. I had come across a story recently that I've been researching for a solo podcast that I'm putting together. Uh, this guy named Cagliostro, who was quite a character back in, uh, I forget what time period it was now, but there's a story that he was trying to spread this Egyptian rite of Freemasonry. And in your book, you do talk about Freemasonry being a continuation of Egyptian mystery schools, for example, but nothing about an actual Egyptian rite. So was this story about Cagliostro spreading an Egyptian rite? Is, is that true? Was there or is there such a thing? Before I answer that, let me let me just say you're absolutely right. I did say Paracelsus burned at the stake, and it was Bruno. So, so I, let me correct myself. With the Egyptian rite in Cagliostro, Pip Falks did a book some years ago that's actually coming out soon as a as a republish on the that talks about him and, and this Egyptian rite. And he's an interesting fella, to say the least. If memory serves, I have so so with the, with the with the notion of Egyptian Freemasonry, it, as you start to dig into this esoteric school, a lot of the writers, so from Case to to Manly P. Hall, Pike to some degree, and others, even even let's say Aleister Crowley, they, they they find this this tradition that that goes back to a period of time out of Egypt that either through cults of the dead or through the for the Book of the Dead had these practices. If memory serves with Cagliostro, he evolved these rites. And, and back at the time of Cagliostro, he constructed these degrees uh, or this Egyptian rite at a time that was ripe for for these practices, these these little theaters of, of degrees, if you will. I mean, mind you, this is the time well before 
books, the prevalency of books, so the ac- accessibility of books or entertainments. And so there is a, a within society, there is a great practice of these rituals of these entertainments. And, and so his was sort of along those lines and he likened it to these magical practices or, or these the pursuit of the philosopher's stone of alchemy and whether or not he was right or not right. Eh, who knows, you know, but he could come in and talk a good talk and, and had constructed these in order to create a new order, you know, much the same way as, as case or Crowley or, or, you know, the guys at the golden dawn and, and so on. So, yeah, I was just, I was just curious about that because, uh, I, uh, was unfamiliar with him until I started doing some research on this thing that I'm working on. And it's funny you mentioned Pip Falks. I just traded some messages with her on Facebook this morning. Oh, right get, on. All yeah, right. I'm trying, I'm trying to get her, <laughs> trying to get her on the show here to, to talk about this book. Do you know Pip at all? I do. I actually, I interviewed her, and I, I, well, I knew her quite some time ago. I, I'm, I'm actually there. she's re-releasing. Uh, I've been in touch with her publicist, and I'm, I'm, she's re-releasing her book. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is it called? It's called The Masonic Magician. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. She's re-releasing it, and and it talks about it, and and he, she she constructs this history of this guy who who charlatan not charlatan you know they in, in a lot of this esoteric tradition that seems to be always nipping at the heels of it is is this level of charlatanism charlatanism uh of whether or not it's true or not true you know with john d you had that with the, the edward kelly you know the, the the whole idea of the rosicrucian order with the mork and and its history uh of spencer even with Crowley and, and the OTO and just his, his evolutions of Thelema, not that they were, I'm not, I certainly am not claiming any of them as being charlatans, but, but there's always an air of this, you know, genuine disingenuineness to it. Uh, and so with his rights with, with Cagliostro, Basamo, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's fun to read. It's fun to remember, but what, the, the the permeation of of his efforts never really took off. Uh, I want to say that that his his system continued, but I have never gone that deep into it just because it's always been like one of those things at the very edges. Uh, but the rights of Memphis Miserium, uh, which mm-hmm. is a if you Google it, you'll actually find the website to it and you can join it. And I hate to use this term, but like this fringy sort of masonry that exists with these Egyptian rites. That's what I want to say that some of his work has evolved into. You know, speaking about charlatanism, I had came across a quote during my, my research about Cagliostro, and uh, I forget who I'm quoting here, but this guy said that, uh, you know, biographies of adepts were not meant to be taken literally, and they were often exaggerated to make the the adept seem more mystical than he really was, even though, you know, they probably were on some level very mystical. But yeah, I, I don't know how much of his story is true and not true. And I think that's probably what people like that want us to think, you know, it's like, we don't know what's true. We don't know what's not true. It's exactly what they want, right? I I don't know. I don't know. Is is it what they want? I, I don't know. You know either. I think I'm that, just guessing. I, <laughs> I mean, it's certainly worth the consideration, but I don't know if it's so much what they want or just more indicative of how they existed. You know what I mean? So, so is it that they wanted to be interpreted as being mysterious or were they mysterious? And is that just more indicative of their personality and their character that, Mm -hmm. that, you, you know what I mean? So, so I mean, there's a level of intentionality there. Sure, maybe the showman wants to be seen, you know, as flashy and, and sequin covered and sparkly. But I, you know, some of these things take a tremendous amount of work. I mean, obviously, putting together a podcast, you know, how much work goes into that. Putting together a book takes a tremendous amount of work. Building websites, putting together whole organizational systems. I mean, in in today's parlance, a lot of these things are are tremendous works that take teams of people, you know, dozens and dozens. I mean, just think of a, an app for your phone. A good one takes a lot of people to, to make sure all the pieces are there together. With some of these old guys in the systems that they put together, so Pike in particular, this Cagliostro, uh, Crawley. I mean, these, these guys are all patriarchs for me in the sense of these guys did this stuff on their own. They sat in probably 
dusty rooms writing and scrawling on paper and thinking about this stuff. So whether or not they wanted it to be remembered as this flash in the pan, or not flash in the pan, but as this, you know, this spectral figure of of occult magic and you, you know, I I I don't know. I I don't think that that's what you think about when you do these things. Maybe once you start to aggrandize it or you get people who follow your system or, or to join or to send. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I think that these are, these are philosophical thinkers who, who were willing to put their ideas down and, and to construct some, either some system or some, I can't think of the word. Think of some cosmology as to, to what it all means. And, and just sort of put it out there to see who would pick it up. You know, I, not to say that, not to draw parallels to, to Christianity at all, but I mean, in some sense, is this any different than someone challenging the, the authority of the time, a la Jesus Christ and, and questioning its existence? You know, this doesn't work like that because of this. And here's why. And let me stand by it. You know what I mean? So, so like, I mean, I just had to pull it up just to refresh my own memory. But so, like, Cagliostro, he did this stuff, and the Inquisition got him. So, you know, who in their right mind would do this stuff knowing that someone would come after him, someone with conviction? Is that wanting to be remembered that way or, or being that way? Or is it really just standing on what they believed in? Maybe he just wanted to bilk people out of <laughs> dues money and give himself a little pension <laughs> to live on. Well, that was a claim that he was sort of a, you know, kind of a fraud <laughs> and, and just took people for what they were willing to give him. So right, yeah, it's a fair right. point. Well, hey, yeah, it's a fair point. But I mean, but in the same sense, think of think of like uh, John D. I, you know, I mean, who can say what his, he was doing? I mean, was he really scrying and seeing stuff in a in a black obsidian stone? Well, he I, he was you know, wasn't. You know? No, no, I mean, no, the no. guy who wrote his. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. John D. wasn't the actual scryer. It was Ed Kelly, but. No, but and, still, but the, with the, <laughs> with the, with the, with the practices, you know what I mean? I wasn't, D, D was mm-hmm. the one that was staring the stone. Kelly was his, uh, his, uh, secretary with it. No, no, it was, it was or vice versa. Or am I the other way around? So D, D couldn't scry. D was the one, he sat there while Ed Kelly stared into the crystal ball, okay. you know, so to speak. And then Kelly, <laughs> Kelly relayed the messages from the angels to D, but there were some messages. I actually joked about this with somebody else on a podcast just recently. You know, there's this great story about Kelly telling D that the angels told him that they needed to swap wives because D's wife yeah. was <laughs> D's wife was like pretty attractive and Kelly's wasn't. So I just thought I thought that was great, and that just goes to show you like how full of shit some of these people probably are. Oh yeah, but it doesn't mean that started. it doesn't mean that yeah, it doesn't mean that that some of what they were doing wasn't you know true or or accurate either. You you know the irony, and, and this will probably make some some listeners mad who maybe are, are following it. But but you know you start looking at Joseph Smith and and some some of his oh yeah um you, you know what I mean the parallels there of, of like yeah I looked into this and it told me blah 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 it told me I could have twelve I, wives and they you know yeah, some of them can be underage yeah I mean, yeah. I, 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 mean I don't want to I don't want to besmirch people and I don't want to besmirch faith I'm I'm certainly not about that at all and and that's a whole other thing that if ever you wanted to get into is looking at the parallels between Freemasonry and Mormonism um it, is a is a whole wild ride um, well, wasn't Joseph Smith a Freemason yeah or, okay and that's and and if memory serves uh, a lot of of the foundational aspects of the church but even in the practice that still happens today i mean wearing aprons with certain symbols and and grips and words almost feel like it you know in in pikeian fashion lifted out of freemasonry and just evolved into this other thing in some in in some really weird aspects if i i and i can't verify this with any sort of uh bibliography or reference but but my gut tells me that if you were to take Freemasonry and religionize it, that that it would be very similar to Mormonism. Hmm. So you take the practice thought. of the lodge and turn it into a religious a religious function. Now again, I couldn't one to one, you know, oh this relates to that, this parallels here, blah blah blah. But but just the bits and pieces because a lot of a lot of the aspects of Mormonism are 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 fairly kept fairly secret. I mean, there are some things that are leaked and, you know, they, they talk about certain things, uh, in the open, but it's the leaked stuff that it's like, 
oh, okay, the, there's weird aprons here. What are these weird aprons? And, you know, these, even in following these sort of hermetic aspects of, of there being a God in heaven and that you become a God, you, you know what I mean? So, so as you start to unwrap this stuff, you know, you can maybe loosely say that there's some, some hermetic connections to it, but it, it you know, it's evolved. It, it's just this, this philosophy evolved. Which maybe, you know, we're, we are in the immediate time right now, and so we can only look plus or minus to ourselves to within a certain degree. Who's to say in, in 100 years? You, you know what I mean? 200 years, what comes of it? Absolutely, man. So, you know, transitioning back to something that you wrote about in your book, Masonic Traveler, you wrote that Freemasonry has always been a system of symbols, but that the symbols of Freemasonry are no longer studied by members. That's curious to me because when you really start to research and study the occult, you learn how important and how powerful symbols and symbology is. I was wondering why the symbols of Freemasonry are no longer studied. What do you attribute that to? Good question. I want, okay, so, so at its surface level, I would say that what you could attribute it to is, is a, overabundance of other things to think about you know that the, the the great cry of of authors or even um i want to say masonic apologists but but just people who who write about or think about freemasonry is that there's just too many distractions television radio internet books i mean basically anything else other than this because studying the masonic symbols is is a lot of work it's not just let me Use a flashcard that'll tell me what this thing is today. You know, and, and this is probably true of a lot of different systems uh, and not just Freemasonry. You know, it's a, a interesting parallel with how many Christians have, have read the Bible cover to cover. You know, they, sure, they'll open it and read certain things or they've read parts of it, but but had they really, like, absorbed the entire thing? So the same thing's true with Freemasonry. You know, there's not a lot of sources. So so there's not a lot of, like, here's an authoritative book. There, there's Freemason for Dummies by Chris Hodap, very good. Uh, Complete Idiot's Guide of Freemasonry. There's a, a countless number of books in stores or in places that you can get from Masonic authors over the years uh, who have written about Freemasonry to, to pick up and read, but... They're dense. They they are not easy. Let me just take small bites and, and digest this in little pieces. So so it's a lot of work. Also, I, I you know some would argue that that it's the individuals that have become Freemasons over the years that just they they're just not into those aspects of it. You know, it's Freemasonry over the last let's say sixty years since nineteen fifty, maybe like seventy years. It, it is definitely in, in continental American Freemasonry taken a much more social aspect. So, so the individuals that are coming to it, and I don't think I'm the only one that, that would say this, are definitely enjoying it more for the social entertainments that it, is, it brings rather than a religion of not being religion philosophy school. So, so that's the difference. So you get different individuals coming to it. You have more. Uh, opportunities for different things to do. I hate to say a, a general disinterest in it, but some of it could be a little bit tedious. And then just an understanding. So, so one of the great laments is that we today lack the language skills of, of generations ago. Uh, in particular, back when, so let's say in the, the decades following when Pike put out Morals and Dogma, that we just don't have the foundations of language and and a philosophy and a rhetoric and and the other liberal arts to understand things in the way that we would have when a lot of these things were written. So maybe in one hand the problem is that uh, a lot of this esoteric thought and masonry is written and and codified in languages from times way back that we just don't have the vernacular for, or that we're just lazy and don't want to spend the time to try to to get up to speed. But you know, it's I, I would say my Latin skill is nil. So when a Latin phrase is used in something that it's, huh, I have to look it up. Uh, or if a particular deity is mentioned or, or a parallel drawn with it, I didn't learn that in school. So I've got to look that up. If a philosopher is mentioned, you know, thank God for Wikipedia. Let me pull that one up. <laughs> yeah. um, 
You, you know what I mean? So, so just by the nature of, of our progression in education, not to say that our education now is, is terrible. I mean, it's certainly lacking, but you know, how important is it to know Latin today? How important is it to, to really understand the depths of the philosophers? I mean, obviously it's important, but who's read Plato's Republic? I probably haven't looked at it in quite a long time. I have a book with it in here. If I need to read it, I can pull it off the shelf. If somebody makes a, you know, vague reference to it. But is it, you know, is it a, is it a, does it dictate the day to day? I think right. that that's why a lot of these things have become less understood, less researched, less studied in, in a regular sense. The long and the short is that it's just it's a lot of work. Well, that and everybody has Netflix, man. Come on. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're spot on or video games or, or app games or even just Twitter or Facebook. I, you know, if, if there is a way to devise, you know, I joked about flashcards, but if there, I, I mean, you certainly couldn't gamify Freemasonry because it would lose something. And that might be what some of the uniqueness of it is or one of its, you know, virtues and sell points is, is that it's not those things. But right now, those things are like the cat's meow. You know, I, that's, it's funny that you mentioned. It. I mean, I, I you know watched a, a video last night on a, not Netflix, but you know a, a, a parallel to it with Amazon. I mean, I, yeah, that's what I did. I didn't crack open morals and dogma. I didn't you know invoke any dark arts or draw any salt circles to <laughs> to summon a demon. No, I watched a, a documentary about love in Japan. There you go. <laughs> you know I, what uh, I mean? Yeah, I, I was reading. I was reading through your stuff uh, in preparation for this, but. You know, at about eleven thirty or twelve o'clock at night, I turn on Netflix. I watch Glow, which is about women's wrestling. Highly recommend. Oh my god! <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> you're probably but... too. I think you told me yesterday how old you were, but I, I sadly enough remember watching Glow when it was actually on TV. Yeah, well, yeah, I was born in '83, and it was on in the '80s, so I I missed the Glow heyday. But I'm yeah. I'm well aware. I'm a wrestling fan, so. I've, I've, I'm well aware of what Glow is and, and its role in the history of professional wrestling. So when I saw they were making a show about it, I got super psyched. And uh, thanks for telling me that it's on there. Now I know I'll be watching tonight. <laughs> do it, man. Yeah, go go check it out. It's 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 well worth it so far. Uh, but I think you hit on something. You know, I think I think the money to me right now is if you wanted to teach somebody occult symbols, is to make an app game out of it. You do see that there is, you know, things like Assassin's Creed or I, I can't, my gaming knowledge has severely went downhill the past few years, but there are things that do touch on these kind of lost arts that we're talking about, Hermeticism and the occult and the, the symbology behind it. And you see them everywhere too in pop culture. It's just nobody knows what they mean and no one knows where they came from. So because which of Netflix. Maybe is, which maybe is a good thing. Maybe maybe it, it's that hint of something that, that would interest somebody to, to, to look more into it. And that's I think that that's the importance of, of a lot of these that's the importance of a, of a lot of these practices continuing on to exist and, and continuing to be published and, and just existing. So so it could it could certainly appear in in games or in movies you know if it's done well i i don't know what a better way of doing it would be you know what i mean so so with one of the resurgences of masonry in in recent years was the movie national treasure or even dan brown's books yeah you know i may be more overt and glitterized but all the same it, it it's a it's a pathway into the knowledge of something and and certainly open the door i i, I would say the the and as ironic as it might sound, the the national treasure phenomenon was this weird, unforeseen hit of juice that that goosed the fraternity at just the right time with the interest in in the regular world. You know, unintentional, totally organic, and and sure, a lot of people went to lodges saying, you know, where's the treasure? How do I become part of it? But you know, of the a hundred people that might knock on a door, one or two of them would be genuinely interested in it, realizing that it was just a hokum movie. And let me find out more about this. So I, I don't know what that answer is. I, you know, a game maybe I, I've thought about these things and, and, you know, pondered what the possibilities were. I think that there are some movies that come out that do very much uh, lean into that. I, I can not tell you offhand i know when i see them in and what i think and movie wise that that really functions at that level but even even one movie in particular and it's horrible but was a strangely um succinct movie in the sense of understanding it was a 
I want to say it was a, a European film or French film, but a, as above, so below. Oh yeah, it was like a was, like a horror film. It was a yeah yeah, but but underneath this the the juicy horrorness of it was this idea of moving between states and moving from from above to below, and, and you know what I mean. So so again, the mechanisms are are kind of weird and kind of silly, but. But when you take the whole thing, I remember watching it. I remember I avoided watching it in the movie, thinking, "Oh, how stupid! How dare they use this phrase? What's with, you know with the with their uh, their lobby cards, the movie posters with it, with the upside down Eiffel Tower? How dumb!" And then I caught it on one of the channels, Netflix or or Amazon or one such, and was like really blown away by it. Like you know, once you get through the the horrorness of it, this has kind of got a pretty cool display or a pretty cool representation of, of what some of these ideas are yeah i watched it too not expecting much because I, I i think it was on netflix and it this was before netflix changed their rating system and it it told you the star rating like based on what you would think of it based on your other things that you've rated and it was like a one or a two star movie but i was like well the title is fucking intriguing man like i have to watch this movie it takes place in right? the it takes place in the uh, in the catacombs of Paris, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I find that area, the catacombs, to be pretty fascinating. I've I've come across some stories about that, just reading about the occult. But I don't think the storyline was particularly good. You know, like the movie wasn't particularly good. But the things that it communicated and showed, like like you said, beyond that, were actually pretty. Uh, I don't want to say spot on, but you know, they, they well, like, communicated weirdly profound, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. They somehow figured that out in, in the overall of it. You're right. Cause the, the, I mean, the acting wasn't terrible. The effects weren't bad. The story. Okay. We'll pick the right one. I mean, it had a, a touch of Indiana Jones and national treasure to it, but, but yeah, the theme, the overall theme. And so maybe that's what this forward communication of a lot of these things are that we'll see it won't be overt it won't beat you over the head with you know this is this because of that it, it's the themes it's the philosophies of these things which yeah. i mean are at work in most everything you know i mean that's what i was gonna say yeah that's w- once you start to to learn about you know we're talking about symbols here or, or we started talking about symbols once you start to learn the symbols and what they mean you see them in in a lot of different places that you've always looked at but never seen them before. You know, does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh man! And once you start down that rabbit hole, it, it's almost hard to not. And at a certain point, you start questioning your own sanity as to what you're seeing. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it, it, is this that? Am I am I really seeing this? Does it mean that? You, you know what I mean? But you see that everywhere. It, it's almost in the same way of like, you know, when you buy a particular car and a particular color of that car, and all of a sudden you start seeing that car everywhere. You know, and, and it's, it's a dangerous road because you do start to question whether or not uh, the things that you're seeing are in fact those things or, or is it just something else? You, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. so it, Am I seeing squares and compasses in this stuff? Or am I just imagining that I am? Am I wanting to see it and I'm seeing it? Well, I think there's something to the power of the mind and and creating that reality, wanting to see it and then it manifesting. But I also think it's it's a bit of a a split between that and it's just already there, you know, that there are people that that consciously put them into their work. Absolutely. So speaking of symbols, I want to stay on this conversation just for a moment because I want to talk about Solomon's Temple. I think before we get into some details about it, if you could briefly explain what the temple is and the role that it plays in Freemasonry. I can do that. So so essentially Solomon's Temple is the the temple from the Old Testament. First Kings, I think, constructed by Solomon, son of David, who won the right to the territory. If I, I'm probably butchering this as a history, but essentially it was it was constructed uh, within Masonic parlance, it was constructed with a number of workmen overseen by King Hiram and King Solomon with the master builder Hiram Abiff. And the symbolic function or structure of it within Freemasonry is that uh, the the temple, the Mason himself, so the individual going through the degrees and everybody in the room all represent these builders of the temple. The temple itself has a, a particular significance to it in the sense that it exists and functions in this particular way, but it's also allegorical or representational of this inner building of oneself. So, so what, you know, 
in one hand, you're a physical builder acting or, or in the role of an, in a Masonic lodge of this builder. So you're pretending it's a word I don't want to use, but is what you're doing is not pretending, but you're, you're basically, that's the understanding. So, so in a philosophical sense, obviously we're not building this literal temple. We are building the spiritual temple within us. So, so as we start to, to unpack this idea of Solomon's temple, Solomon's temple was constructed originally in order to house the Ten Commandments. So in the Ark, at the holiest of holies, the most inner sanctum where the only person who could go in was the high priest. Uh, it was literally the house of God because it was believed that, that the divine, not in some magic way, lived inside these Ten Commandments, but as Christ was this manifestation of God above, the, the Ten Commandments also were this manifestation of, of the will of God to the people as it was given to uh, Moses on the Mount Sinai and these commandments put into this ark, carried around for a long time, housed in these impermanent temples as they spent their time in the desert, and finally put into this, this, this temple. So in the Masonic sense, Obviously, we're not literally building this temple. So, so in some sense, we we are constructing this inner temple, which is housing. And this is open to interpretation, but this is perhaps a, a good way of seeing it. We are constructing this inner temple to house this inner divine, which again goes back to these hermetic ideas and and these ideas of the nature of the divine of, of the supreme being, you know, outside the context of Judeo Christianity, but in this, and I hate to keep belaboring it, but this hermetic idea of man as being divine creator created in the image of God and, and constructing this inner temple. And so out of this construction of this inner temple, there's particular rites and rituals that take place within Freemasonry, which I won't get into that you can, I'm sure you could find online, but, but have certain aspects to do with the secrets of Freemasonry in the sense of inheriting this role and then manifesting this masterness. So, so becoming a master Mason is a process that takes place in the temple as the master builder and its conclusion is is what you could say is sort of the the last nail in the box of of this construction of the individual the last chip of the the stone all an allegory all story but again which takes place in this imaginary allegorical temple in this imaginary allegorical lodge of master masons who were building the temple uh within this system of freemasonry that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great explanation. And I, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's important to note here too that Agrippa wrote in his uh, three books of occult philosophy that the universe was divided into three worlds or maybe three degrees, which parallels the, the path of the Master Mason. And those three worlds consisted of an elemental world, a celestial world, and an intellectual world. And each world received influences from the world above it. So I was wondering if you could maybe just briefly flesh out you know what these three worlds consist of well you know it's interesting so so if memory serves that was i think i put that back in the early book of the masonic traveler book and so in this idea is and this is something that i've been exploring in, in the more recent books so in the apprentice the fellow of the craft and the master mason which is coming that these states of being are if first in one hand progressions into this kabbalistic tree of life so we'll go back to that parallel from the material world uh, moving up into the celestial heaven. So so in the books that I'm that I'm read just referenced, The Apprentice and Fellow of the Craft, they, they are the beginning steps from Malkuth into Tav going into Yasad. And the idea is that it's this climb, this this starting at the foundation, this elevation into the the heavens, and and then the next step of Yasad, which I won't go into until the book's out, but moving into this philosophical space of a vastly expanding universe. So at the very bottom, we, we start in this place of chaos. And, and in my writing, so in the first book in that series, it's the series of the Symbolic Lodge, that what I talked about. And this parallels with Agrippa. Ironically, you know, in writing, I think that I, I just internalized a lot of this and, and didn't use it as direct reference. But obviously those not going through this system not to say that they're right or wrong in their existence and how they operate, but 
but when you come to the door of Freemasonry, you exist in this world of chaos. So, so, and by chaos, I don't mean, you know, hell kind of chaos. There's no crying and gnashing of teeth necessarily. It's not pain. It's not this. It's just more the philosophical idea of chaos, of just the, the movement of gears and the, the grinding of life and, and the, the not stopping to smell the rosesness of existence. And, and it's at the point that the decision is made to, to join not just Freemasonry, but any system of esoteric study as a group or even on your own practice it's a coming to a door it's a decision uh to move up through this system into those higher spheres so so starting out at the firmament you're through the chaos uh to use a, a darwinian ideas we crawl out from the chaos under the land into this foundational world so so you begin as a babe in the woods of of this idea but but now stopping to become a part of it. Once that process is complete, you then move into the next and, and you move into this elemental world of trying to understand of the broadening of the mind to, to this understanding as a fellow craft, the, the association of others who have gone on this path as well. So, so it's a, another step in the initiation and then to move into the, to the celestial apartments above. So, so moving up further into these spheres, uh, philosophical spheres, uh, within the symbolic lodge and, and walking the final steps into the sanctum sanctorum, into the presence of the ark and those tablets, you know, and, and one of my notions of this, you know, and, and, and all the symbolism of it, essentially the, the holy of holies is, is a, is a room. There's no windows. The only way in is through a curtain or through a door and no one else is allowed in or can see it because the only person allowed in is, is the high priest. But in this process of doing this in, in, philosophically understanding and trying to interpret it obviously with pike and his further degrees up to the 32nd and 33rd there's a system beyond it so so maybe in some scientific sense or or just in a more of a metaphorical sense there is a transitionary threshold that has to be crossed in order to go beyond that into these further celestial apartments of degrees and and that's what I think in in the wayback writings of Agrippa as he was starting to write about these spheres and, and the evolutions of of the Christian or Western Kabbalah in trying to interpret these things and, and smash them together to see if they would stick or or to reconglomerate them into these new configurations that that is is what's at the heart of these systems that in Freemasonry in particular, in the really deepest recesses of, of what it means to, to become a Freemason, for what it means to take the teachings to heart. Now, it's, it, you know, you could very easily just superficially go your way through it and say, okay, yeah, that's what it means. Let's see what's on TV and disregard it all. But this goes back to what you said earlier about how deeply you study Masonry. Now, maybe I've overstudied it and blown a fuse in my head, but it seems to me that these systems, as they evolve, as you start to associate the writings of Pike, that, that it is this progression up at the early level through these three degrees. But then as you surpass that, you start going from the symbolic lodge into the lodge of perfection, into the Rosicrucian uh, parallels, and then as you start going up into the consistory, that, like, I want to say that, that in some of the early sketchings that I've done in trying to understand these degrees, as let's say you draw the, the ten sephira of the tree of life, at certain intervals, there's like bubbles that exist under it. And it's through those bubbles that you start to enter into different spheres of thought, which take you into these deeper Agrippa climates. So, so it's a, it's this, it's this macro, this micro and this macro understanding. It's this as above, so below, which gets overused. The parallel is that what you see at the bottom mirrors the top. But you don't see it until you get to the top. And, and it doesn't make a lot of sense until you start to understand it in the sense of moving through it and you reach those levels to look back and say, okay, so I, I'm in the same position that I started in, which isn't a bad thing. But you know, what, what's happened is that there's been a spiritual growth where sure, you're probably standing in near the same positions that you started in with it, but your understanding of these things is vastly different. So what may have looked as a flat plane before is now curved or, you know, what may have looked, uh, dull and dingy is now rich and, and glittery. You know, I mean, these, these are just sort of like, you know, philosophical navel gazing in, in some of the understandings, but, but I mean, these, these do go to direct interpretations of, 
of how we evolve as people. You know, we, we don't have the same opinions that we had in the past. And so, you know, is that an occult growth or is that just progression, which is something that Freemasonry teaches in these fellow craft degree of the sense of going through these stages of maturity. So, you know, in the macro or the, or the micro, or the macro, it, it, it's small and it's large and, and it's this continuum of progression. I think it's a bit of both. It, it is, I think, occult growth. And I think by occult, I actually mean spiritual. I right. also yeah. think yeah. that the, the word occult is overused and it's uh, misinterpreted too. And I think that's just what we're talking about. It's, it's spiritual growth. It's, it's progression. It's, it's all of the above. And just to tie up the conversation about Salman's temple, you have a quote from Dame Frances Yates. She suggested that Solomon's temple represented a definition of sacred geometry that was mirrored in the temple by reflecting a perfect and proportional measure made in accordance with the unalterable laws of cosmic geometry. I have to ask you, Greg, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> well, you're, you're not a high enough degree yet to understand that, so I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I, you know... So Yeats was some of her work's been questioned, but only because it was when it was written. So so a lot of the conclusions that she made at the time in her books, not maybe not a lot, but just the the core of her conclusions are sort of questioned because of either her philosophical leanings at the time, or just you know maybe she was just over blathering about things and and not quite being concise or, or not interpreting it in in with these other things in mind. I would say in in just looking at this poll quote at the time at the time that a lot of freemasonry was codified and Solomon's temple was woven into it ideas of sacred geometry of the 47th problem of of Euclid and and Euclid himself geometry was looked at as sort of this religionized or the sacred math of proportion and volume and space and, and i mean the tools if you look at the tools of themselves are freemasonry a square and a compass so you're drawing circles and you're drawing right angles i mean that's the basis of geometry was uh maybe over religionized and i want to say that that's probably what it is that she's trying to say in this and so then with solomon's temple so if you go into the to the books of the bible it gets into the the specifics of its size and its construct and the elements that have gone into it and and the the proportions therein and and, and it's al- in some sense i want to say it's almost a, a glamorization or a idealization of of what perfect proportion is or what would be a right and true measure. I, I mean, I'm kind of just shooting in the dark here. And what do you think? And tell me what your thoughts are to it. And let's see if that helps pull anything out of my peanut. Well, that quote was <laughs> that quote was over my head. That's why I asked you what the hell it meant. Because <laughs> I tried to make sense of it so I could form a better question around it. Because I, you know, I wanted to segue that into a talk about you know the role that geometry or, or sacred geometry plays in Masonic philosophy. But I didn't know how to get there. And this quote I thought was a was a good gateway to that, but I can't. It, I don't know probably, what she meant. That's the thing. I I just have no idea. It probably is. So so let's go. I mean, to the to the the, the passage itself. So what I wrote what I what I wrote in here in, in the, with the pull quote with this. So it says Francis in in Francis Yates' text, the occult philosophy of the Elizabethan age, a book she wrote, suggests that the early Renaissance Kabbalists felt that the temple represented a definition of sacred geometry that was mirrored in the temple by reflecting a perfect and proportional measure made in accordance with the unalterable laws of the cosmic geometry. So if memory serves, and in, in in what this is saying is is in a sense that the fetishization of the the Solomon's temple with those Renaissance Kabbalists created this construct of, of what they felt perfection was within these geometric and mathematical constructs of, of space and size and, and parallels in, into the apartments of the heavens, if you will, in the sense of space and design. I mean, it, it's very much a romanticized ideal of, of what this geometry is. It, further in the quote, it pulls into the Vitruvian principles, so, so Vitruvius who with his orders of architecture was a you know, maybe mid period Roman uh, architect, a sense who who codified for the Romans what the perfection, the quote unquote perfection was of Roman architecture in the sense of uh, what worked, how you put fountains in, what directions you face the fountains. In particular with Vitruvius, the orders of architecture within Freemasonry and Freemasons will, will 
key into this because they'll they'll understand what that means. But the orders of architecture were, were adopted based on the Vitruvian orders of architecture. So so the orders of architecture of Vitruvius it goes from a, a the the types of pillars. So Tuscan, Doric, I I think it's Ionic. Ionic, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's really in the day. Uh, all the way up to Corinthian. So 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 it's these and then composite, but. I mean, these these are sort of like our history terms that we look at today as just sort of being uh, things that we throw around. But in these early writings and, and adopting these ideals of, of proportion and size, uh, even back to, to Roman temples and Greek temples being constructed facing east and, and to these divine proportions, that's where I think that I was going with that quote. And so to your question about geometry, is geometry really a factor in the Masonic Lodge? And, and to be frank, the honest is no. They, there is parallels with with the idea of geometry, uh, the letter G being in particular, this ideal of perfection. And I, I would say that you could make the argument that it has to do with uh, just the preciseness of geometry. But obviously, there, there are mathematics that take more into account these aspects of either perfection or of more dynamic measure with calculus or trigonometry, but geometry coming back to the spatial measure, this exactness of the measures themselves, you know, hence the, the parallels with the universe. And, and these get tossed in with this idea of the Masonic letter G, you know, which is, is parallel with God and geometry. And that's where these different things get smooshed together crafting this this notion of of geometry and freemasonry that g is open or is subject of much debate you know i don't know if freemasons actually really sit around and talk about what the g stands for but it seems like all the non-freemasons do and i think you know you you kind of now you just kind of squash that it stands for geometry uh we've also heard that it stands for god but if I was a betting man, Greg, and I am a betting man, so <laughs> I would put my money on the G actually standing for Gnosis, just because um, of the. Hey, hold on, let me no, just, no, no, go just ahead, go ahead, make your argument. I'm I'm reaching over to my library of books that I've kept here and pulling one out for for you to. Well, my only sit. my only argument here is that we do find traces of Gnostic thought in Freemasonry, this Gnostic idea of Sophia, of knowledge, of Gnosis, you know, playing a role in Freemasonry, this, this, the ultimate enlightenment of the self. It just seemed like if that G stood for anything that wasn't God or wasn't geometry, which I think is too obvious, I would bet that it stands for Gnosis because that is the ultimate, I think, goal of Freemasonry. It could be, but so gnosis capital g or gnosis lowercase g so gnosis knowledge or gnosis early christian church gnostic gnosis capital g knowledge it could be who am i to say <laughs> who am i to say I, so so here here is something that i will say about it the, there is no hard and fast rule book as to what is or what is not exactitude and masonic symbolism so so in some iterations of masonry the g is dropped altogether from from the inside of the square and compass uh it may or may not be displayed over the east of a lodge in some of those iterations within the square and compass the yod the jewish letter yod the uh, little squiggle you can google it and see it Mm -hmm. it is there instead which is you know part of the the tetragrammaton of this representation of God. In others, there's a star, five-pointed star. In other iterations, there's no G, there's no Yod, there's no star. It's a, it's a, it's an all-seeing eye. I, as much as I hate to say that it's open to interpretation, I, I think that the the letter G in the center of the square and compass is is a design decision that was made at some point uh, not to be vague and and miscommunicative but to encompass as many meanings as possible within that very small space to try to either appease or appeal to as many people as it can so the what the book that i was pulling is a uh, is actually a very small book and and you could probably find it online somewhere it's a, a paul foster case book let me see when it was written and, and you can see if you could find it i do not believe that it's online 
because it goes back and it's probably still under subject of copyright. I'm looking at one published in 1981, but it goes back further than that. It's called the Masonic Letter G. And, and it's a, it's an exploration by Paul Foster Case, one of the individuals that I, I think we connected earlier to the Kabbalion, uh, in its very early days. This is done much later. So, so we'll just skip right to the back. All right. Or let's start. Let's, we'll I'll just start a little bit at the front. And, and just in this little book that he wrote, he, he writes, it is difficult to determine when the letter G was introduced into speculative Freemasonry as a symbol. Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry says this letter is not derived from the operative masons of the Middle Ages and form no part of the architectural decorations of old cathedrals. He goes on, he brings up Rosicrucians and Kabbalists. In second second chapter or second paragraph, he says the Masonic meaning of the letter G never has been esoteric. The whole world has been told that the symbol loses its prominence to the fact that G is the initial of geometry. This makes it a symbolic summary of the entire Masonic system. Uh, which may be. And so we skip to the end, and, and I won't give away the conclusion of it, but, but he says that uh, it, it ties into, let's see, letter G corresponds to the value of three, but in English G is the seventh letter. Thus it represents the triple force and the seven stages of a sublimation. Hence it corresponds also to the digits of 73, signifying chokma, wisdom developed from the seed kosh, trust, and constituting Guamal, their recompense, which is the master's wage of those who travel east on the camel. Gimel of earnest endeavor. But, I mean, but this is Case, and Case evolved his own system of esoteric teaching through builders of the Adatum using tarot and, and numerology. Not to say that what he's writing is incorrect, but, but that perhaps goes to show the vagueness as to what exactly that letter means and and just sort of the institutional assumptions of certain meanings and just holding true to particular aspects. It's way easier to say that the G represents God than to get into what the varieties of of that God or that G mean. Does that make sense? So I think in, in mm-hmm. one hand, it's very easy to step back and say, okay, yeah, that's what it means. It's God or geometry. Well, maybe God is geometry. Maybe that's what they mean. Well, maybe it's just geometry or maybe it's gnosis. It may be, but I, maybe that's that's trying to over-intellectualize something at a much more simplistic level than than at some point to just sort of mean that that it's it's this sort of sublime divine idea that's encapsulated within this very angular square and this circumscribing compass which are both aspects of freemasonry that have to do i think with this broader hermetic idea of moving from from the firmament into the heavens so you're moving geometrically from this very square 90 degrees into this very round compass yeah but you're also moving closer to gnosis greg Uh, well absolutely but in that process that's what you're gaining so i i don't i don't disagree with you i'm i'm i you know it it is way open to interpretation personally I, i am not a fan of the g in there just because it does create such a specific meaning at the onset rather than it having uh more of the the vague speculation so so better to have nothing in there and let it be open to interpretation uh rather than try to pigeonhole it into a very particular way of thinking about it by putting the letter there it's like you you can have no other idea of what that means in that space than by what you see so if you don't see anything, then maybe that's a better way of understanding it. I would agree. I, I like that it, it is open to interpretation either way, whether it's there or not. So, you know, somewhere somewhere in this conversation, we mentioned the three pillars. And the, you have a good section in uh, the Masonic Traveler book about the three pillars and what they represent. So they do represent directions, you know, south, west, and east. And I was curious why North was not represented in there. You say that that North in Masonic tradition is considered a place of darkness. Why is that? Well, I mean, without getting too deep into the ritual, just just for the secrets, as it were. I mean, just in in thinking about the transit of the sun. So 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 just in the transit of the sun, the sun hits the the east, obviously in the morning, the west in the evening, and the south the better part of the day but depending upon where you are on the globe the the, the north obviously is a uh, is not illuminated 
I mean, I don't want to get too deep. So, so as we start to look at the pillars themselves, I mean, obviously it's three pillars. So if we're looking at a Kabbalistic system, it's three, not four. And so, you know, maybe that's a, a syncretic omission that they omitted it because there's not a fourth aspect. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think that I've dissected it enough to, to have a firm enough understanding. So, or at least to have a, a informed enough opinion of it. I can say for, for in particular within the Masonic degrees, there, there are references as to the North, the North Gate, but you know, it's, I, I don't want to go too deeply into that just because there are particular aspects of the secrecy involved with that. That's totally maybe fine, one day man. you'll maybe. find out. <laughs> I, I, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe one day I will. So I did have a, a really kind of trippy thought while reading this section about the pillars that I wanted to share with you just real quick. You said that the East is seen as the birthplace of knowledge, of life, and of death. The East, of course, is also where the sun rises each day. We all know that. And this got me thinking about lifetimes and past lives and reincarnation and things like that. I've always felt personally drawn to the East from a cultural perspective and I've thought many times that perhaps I, I lived a past life in the East, maybe. And then I thought about how I live in the West now. I'm in the U.S., and you know, so are you. And that got me thinking about the pattern of the sun, you know, rising in the East and setting in the West. And how that may be a metaphor for the pattern of the soul or the spirit as it incarnates in physical form. I've been told many times that I have an old soul, whatever that actually means. So... All this considered, my, my rather trippy conclusion was that I personally am near the end of my physical existence, both literally and metaphorically. My sun is setting in the West, where I currently live. As someone who is far more knowledgeable in the metaphysical, do you think I'm onto something here with this thought, or am I completely off base, and do I just feel drawn to the East because I do seek this, this sort of esoteric knowledge? Let me start, say first, I, I don't know if I'm in a position to say if you're right or wrong. I don't think anybody is, you know, that, that sort of harkens to the personal journey thing. What I will say is in finding parallels with, with things that I've either gone through or found to be truer uh, in the sense of the East is that they, there seems to be, and, and I hate to say that I, this may be just my own fetishisms of, of these Eastern thoughts, but there seems to be a, I hate to use the word pure because again, that, that's so patronomious of me or I don't know what the word is, but the, the, the notions that come out of Eastern philosophies are a more recent development and Manley Hall writes about them and, and seems to fetishize them and, and as do others. But as, as these have come in, I think that we find a greater resonance with them. In the sense of, of our spiritual unfolding, uh, two books that, that I, one book, but they really split in two, is Raja Yoga, which, which is a Eastern philosophy. It's a, it's a form. It's one of the branches of yoga and, and it kind of gets a little trippy dippy at the end, but, but it really speaks to some of these cores and, and some of these, uh, philosophies. And then, uh, Yogananda. The teachings of Yogananda, I think the self-realization of the self, a biography out there that I've been trying to get through. It's very different thought than Western thought. So so to your question of, of is what you're thinking correct, who's to say? I mean, it depends on, on what you what you follow uh, philosophically in, in the sense of tradition or of, of faith, of what you even see is like uh, reincarnation or or going to heaven or or things like that. So so your cos cosmology, your cosmology of, of how the universe functions. Who's to say? I mean, I you know I think you could certainly be a, a an old soul or, or in Rosicrucian terms even a reincarnated soul or or probably more Hinduism and, and Eastern philosophy. Certainly, as as souls travel through the universe, whether or not we know it, uh, who knows? Uh, Amork does some interesting work in trying to scry to find these past lives, but certainly any sort of meditative practice could could utilize could produce the same results of of perhaps seeing these these other things, these past lives. So so maybe in what you're sensing is is 
and this, you know, I don't want to sound like some prognosticative hoodoo guru, but it could just be the, the interest in these things evolving and, and tapping into that subconscious connection that you have to these things that may or may not be at the end because saying that there's a, an end means that there's a definitive beginning. And, and I don't know if I'm willing to say that there's a, a definitive beginning or end. Yes, there's a beginning of end of time, big bang to now. But even before that, what existed? So, so can we say that there's a definitive timeline? You know, this goes to the, the whole thing of matter, uh, ceasing to exist. Does matter cease to exist or does it become a different energy source or, or does it become something else? I don't know if there's a distinct beginning, middle or end. There, there's progression. There's, there's time. There's regression. And, and there's a whole big, you know, circle of life if you will i mean it just the process keeps on going whether or not the consciousness that's existing and talking to me now is as ryan and this podcast is at a beginning or end is is neither here nor there i think i think it's just the the state of being of where you're at right now you know i mean this this goes to the whole mindfulness of of being in the moment rather than worrying about the future or fretting at what happened in the past you know which i think it has validity in in the sense of trying to improve oneself you know because if you're stuck worrying about what came before or worrying about the future and and it's easy to say because i do that you know i worry about what, what the future holds in one way or another but those things are, are sort of out of your hands and and i think that's where it comes back to the effort and work of of what you're doing in order to create and to manifest pulling these hermetic ideas of being one of the divine's craftsmen making things I, I definitely, uh, I subscribe to that rather than trying to think of things as, as either coming from source or going to source. I, you know, sources, what is source? Source is just a, a, a bus terminal in between another source, which is an, another terminal in between another one. So I don't know. I mean, does that, am I answering you? And, and I appreciate your saying, am I complimenting me on, on this esoteric knowledge? I, I you know, I, I've read a lot of books and, I, you know, I would by no means say that I'm, you know, a guru like that. It just seems to me that these, they, there are certain, certain realities at play that, that are outside of what we're told as, as the norm. And I don't mean like hokum stuff, aliens and this and that, or, you know, spirit, just that, that they, there are greater philosophical or spiritual energies at work that may not be contributors to the day-to-day -day functionings, but certainly exist at some meta level to either influence or just shape the, the world around us. Hmm. I guess I was just trying to get to the source of my fetish for Asian food. I, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's the egg rolls, dude. It's a philosophy. Oh, I know. Man. Yeah, it is, man. It is. <laughs> I, I would recommend Indian food. I, I don't know if you're a fan of Indian food. I am. Yeah, yeah, I've been eating. You know, it's funny. I've been eating a lot of Indian food recently, to be honest. I have this... Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say it's great because it's like a, it's like an eight dollar lunch buffet, but there's a there's a there's like a place near where I work, and uh, I've been going to lunch there quite a bit actually. But anyways, so let's get back let's get back to some more uh, philosophical discussion here. There are thirty two degrees in the Scottish Rite. We've talked about this. Uh, we talked about this early in the conversation. The thirty third degree that you hear so much about is one that can't be earned. It's sort of honorary, from my understanding. I've also read that when it comes to esoteric Freemasonry, that there may be degrees above thirty three. Is there any truth to that? Oh man, within what is considered mainstream Freemasonry, no. Uh, there's a branch I, I could, it escapes me right now as to what it is, and it might be under Memphis Misrium. I think it's under that Cagliostro Memphis Misrium that it goes up to. 360 degrees which i mean has its own interesting philosophical conundrums to it but could you imagine trying to attain 360 degrees i they would just start conferring degrees you know in the tens or hundreds at a time okay here you get degree 250 to 300 today so within masonry i, I don't I've heard, and this is anecdotal, but I've heard that in the past when, when the Scottish Rite rolled out its degrees, the ideal was, and, and that I heard that this happens still in some places in South America, that the degrees would be given one per year. So as an individual, you would progress one degree a year after you've had that year to either understand it fully and come up with some, they call it a piece of architecture that explains 
your understanding of that particular degree. So the first degree is one year, second degree, third degree. So at the end, you have literally spent 32 years, which is why there weren't a lot of 32 degree Masons. Scottish Rite in America has changed that they don't do that anymore. Now they confer degrees in chunks. Understandably so, because it's just so much and, and it's hard in a, in a time and age where, where there's just not the attention span for that. Could you imagine taking 32 years to try to go through something? I mean, you, you said you're mid thirties or so now, I think. Could you imagine by the time you were mid sixties that you were finishing it? Hmm. Like, well, I, I mean, couldn't, I couldn't tell you what I'm doing in 10 years, <laughs> let alone to say yeah. that I'm still going after this in 30 years. I think if you look at it like, uh, if you don't look at it like a task, you know, if you don't look at it like it's a job to do this, then I, I think if you approach it with, you know, the mindset that, you know, for the next 32 years of my life, I'm going to, to strive to be, a better version of me than I was the year before. I think that mindset with that approach, it makes it more achievable to me. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean that I'm going to be looking ahead, you know, to the future. It just means that I'm going to take this time right now to just be better day after day after day. And then, you know, year after year after year. And by the time I'm, you know, I'm 33. So by the time I'm 65, you know, maybe I will have learned something by then. That's how I would look at it. Well, and, and, and certainly I think that you're absolutely right. And, and that's probably the mechanisms that are at work within Freemasonry in the sense of a continued, you know, a daily progression of knowledge under the, under the fraternity. Same thing with Judeo Christianity of, of studying the Bible every day or studying the Talmud every day or Islam and studying the Quran a little bit every day. And I mean, I think that those are the underpinnings behind any philosophical, religious or, or spiritual system is that you, it does take that time. But I mean, in the context of, of your question, in the sense of, of these additional degrees and, and the further down the line that you get, I mean, there's just not enough time in the day to, to try to absorb it all over this long extended period of time. I mean, I, I, on Twitter the other day, I was just sort of fishing just to sort of build out memory for me of all these different orders of systems. And I want to say that systems like Freemasonry, I think that I came down to nine or 10 different that are of similar stature and age and, and composition. And, and if you were to spend your time in five of those, that could easily be a lifetime. You know, I mean, you can study bits and pieces here or there, or try to assimilate different aspects of all of them. And just try to to have an understanding, but but it's a tremendous amount of effort. You know, it'd be one thing if we were monks or nuns cloistered in a in a convent somewhere or an abbey, and that's all we did is sat and studied this stuff. But we're not. We live life, and so it it is very hard to try to have a, a complete and comprehensive understanding. Even scholars, I, I think, there's, there it would be impossible to have this grand unified theory of all of these and try to put them in some encyclopedic book to to say this is what this means, this is what this guy said, this is what that guy said, this is how it relates. And at the end of the day, I don't know if it would be worth it because, I mean, cross sectionally, a lot of these things seem to all same say, say the same thing. And just parallel one another. You know, it, it, as silly as it sounds, all roads lead to Rome. Well, in this sense, they kind of do. There are some tangents. I mean, you could start going out in some wild rides. Crawley and Thelema with OTO. or and, and I don't make these parallels for people to say, she's connected them. But things like uh, Anton LaVey's Satanism or Spencer's Rosicrucianism or... Paul Foster cases, but uh, they, they all sort of branch out, but they all have fingers back into these four systems. So I don't know about Satanism. That, that's an, that'd be an interesting study, uh, yeah. but even like religious systems, you know, so, so Mormonism having these connections back to Freemasonry, you could spend the time in any of these systems studying them, trying to find parallels or just grow more deeply in them and never step out of that box which is entirely possible. But I, you know, if you were to add additional degrees to the systems, or even if you were to try to undertake them, I, it would be astronomical. I, you know, there was a, there was a running joke with folks who go to lodge. I, I'm not too keen into that much at all anymore, but, but the running joke was for some that they could 
go to a different dinner every night of the week for different lodges or different groups within Freemasonry that they had association with. So, I mean, you could be so involved in these things that you know, one would question whether or not you're getting anything out of them because you're so involved, because you're going to different meetings or different groups or, you know what I mean? You're going to, to Blue Lodge, you're going to York Rite, you're going to Scottish Rite, you're going to Shrine, you're going to different, the Jester's meetings or, you know what I mean? There's all these different groups that you could go out and do things with that at a certain point, there's just no more space for input. There's no way to interpret any of them that they all just sort of become this association. So, so this idea of there being, you know, lots and lots of degrees. I, I mean, maybe the person who's got a 360th degree knows something more than I do, but you know, or in some systems. So like in a, in, I want to say it's OTO, maybe some of the higher degrees are just degrees you can't get while you live that, that you evolve into it, you know, as you pass and you become this higher thing or higher power. What was it? Scientology with uh, L. Ron Hubbard that, that mm -hmm. at the high, he, you, know, you don't die. You just transmute into this next state of being a quote unquote degree and go on with your spiritual studies at that level. So. More doesn't necessarily constitute better, I think. So maybe there are more degrees, but in mainstream Freemasonry, there isn't, to, okay. to the best yeah. of my knowledge. And if there is, I've never been invited or asked to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Before we get out of here, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this. It seems that there's been a bit of a hit job on Freemasonry, at least from my perspective, because you know, we brought up the church earlier and the, the Inquisition and, and you know, that, that sort of stamping out of these hermetic principles. But, you know, beyond that, I know that in conspiracy circles that Freemasons have been cast as villains, you know, sort of hell-bent on world domination and, you know, shit like that. And there seems to be no distinction between them and other groups like the Bavarian Illuminati or the, the Rosicrucians or any other esoteric group, really. But I was wondering how you address people who see Freemasonry as nefarious. I think that we look... As, as a society, as a culture, we look for boogeymen in places. And, and where we want to see them, we'll see them. Whether or not we have inputs from other places, we will see what we want to see. I don't know if I would go so far as saying that it's a, a hit job like that, as much as it is individuals looking for villains in theaters that of their construction to... to be the foils to whatever other plans that they're seeing, which is a really vague way of answering this. I don't know. I mean, I think that, that the Illuminati has been, and maybe rightly so, because even some prominent Masons way back, George Washington denounced the Illuminati, but the Illuminati had an, uh, an interesting, its core was a very interesting idea of unification, something that, that, is happening maybe more so now than at the time to overthrow monarchs and, and papacies and, and have governments of the people unified to help the people. But instead it's taken as, you know, this group who is looking for world control and to, to usher in world domination, to control people. Um, and so those ideas have, have evolved and, and taken heart with, Things like Bohemian Grove or the Bilderbergers. And I am in no position to argue the merits or, or dismerits of any of those things, uh, with individuals who see those as sacred cows. I mean, that, you know, you might as well try to convince a wall that it's a walkway than try to convince some of these conspiracy folks. But I will say that I have had conversations with people who, who have been open to these things and evolved their thinking to them and and looked at them in a different light but i mean you might as well change tell a leper to change its spots for for trying to convince folks of some of this stuff and so why they villainize them i think because they need to they need the boogeyman villain to point to as as the foil to whatever virtuous thing that they think that they're foiling so whether or not it's it's from the foundation of the church pushing these agendas or people just looking for saying who's covering up aliens or who's doing horrible things to children. I, I think people just look to a group that, oh, 
One thing I will add is that Freemasonry itself is not very keen or interested in trying to fight these individuals, so they won't dispute them openly and and aggressively. Uh, whereas, say, like you know, the the reports of of Scientology suing everybody who ever says anything disparagingly about them, uh, Freemasonry has no interest or will to do that for a variety of reasons behind the scenes, but it, it just won't. And so these people can come out and say the most heinous things. They'll point to the most minuscule of things, you know, something like P2 Lodge and how they were tied to the mafia. And so all of them must be tied to the mafia or Albert Pike, you know, wrote about World War Three and these things. There are very few people that will come out and fight and dispute those uh, aggressively. And so I think that that's why people continuously go back to the well, to the, to the boogeyman Freemasons who don't, nobody stands up to fight them on it. And the ones that do are very superficial and small, uh, not small in their caliber, but just small in the sense of, of the greater noise of, of the people who are making the accusations. You know, it's one thing for, for me or someone else. There's a, there's a, a fellow that's on Twitter who in my feed, I constantly see him refuting some of the crazy things that people say about Freemasonry. If you have Hootsuite, just put in Freemasonry as uh, a follow keyword and just look at some of the asinine things that people post about it. And to no audiences, they're probably bots or just other jagoffs who are just posting up things to be controversial, you know, in Pizzagate format. But this one guy, he he is like on the daily posting <laughs> refutations to people and just fighting them blandly just telling him no it's not you know bluntly in what he's saying in in very few words but he's taking the time to do it but it but it it is a tremendous amount of work in in a area that is just saturated with dumbasses who who try to make all sorts of parallels and it, christian authors have written about it they've tried to drag it through the church there was a time I think the, the guy's name is Shaw, Jim Shaw, who wrote a book that was very much taken to heart by a, a, a vast majority of Christians in the United States, probably back in the 80s and 90s. I'm not sure the dates. And and it's just it continues to be the fodder for people to just beat up because no one will say anything about it. That was a good answer. And I have to agree with you. You mentioned that, or you kind of talked around maybe the, uh, you know, when you really study the ideals of these groups at their core, nothing about them seems nefarious. You know, like even Adam Weishaupt's Bavarian Illuminati group seemed to really be interested in the same things we've been discussing, you know, Gnosis, enlightenment of the self and knowledge and things like that. And, you know, these free thinking principles that we've been talking about, this knowledge of self, this direct connection to the divine, I don't see that as, as a bad thing. I mean, I could see how it is to groups like the church or, you know, uh, Zionist Jews or Muslims or anything like that who really stake their faith in, in books and intermediaries. So I could see how, you know, I call it a hit job because I guess I might be a little more conspiratorial than you in that sense, but it does seem like there may, there may have been to me just uh various groups throughout the ages that that try to you know squash free thinkers obviously that was the point of the inquisition i think so that's my approach to this sort of conversation is is that it just seems to me that that there was a deliberate attempt to kind of you know weed out this these sorts of free thinking principles from mainstream culture probably but but i mean the reason behind that so so why because it it put to task and challenge the the powers that be. So, so the status quo is just changing the status quo. So, so yeah. it villainized, it was villainized to the point of, of, of being, uh, a social evil, if you will. I, I mean, I think you're, you're right. I mean, it, 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 that, that's what was happening. That continues to this day, but you know, maybe this is some of the reason for why these ideas don't come out. We talked earlier about the, the movies. Or, or different the medium, the different mediums of trying to convey these things. Maybe because it, it is the baggage that it comes with. You know, if you were to put Masons in a movie, or if you put the Illuminati in a movie or in a story, they, they're from the get go the villain, or or at least uh, shadowy enough that that they their their virtue is questionable. Or their intentions are questionable as to, to what they're doing. Not so much the case in National Treasure, which I think is why it was a success. But, you know, you mentioned the Illuminati and who are the Illuminati? The Illuminati is a villain. Straight up. 
but without really knowing about it. So, so maybe it's our, our lack of knowledge about them that really conveys the, the definitions that we run with moving forward. I mean, you know, and some of the, some of the things that the Illuminati did purport to do or, or did want to do was, was seemed, if memory serves, was a little bit had less than peaceful means. So, so overthrowing and taking control, but, you know, it certainly wasn't a, a pacifistic, let's just all sit in circles and vote, uh, and yeah. vote the right way. So, so maybe in some cases that those evil justifications or the evil conclusions of these groups is valid. But, you know, if you throw the rest of the philosophy out with it, you know, Karl Marx gets, uh, gets horrible PR on, on what he wrote. But if you look at the, the meat of it, it was, well, to use a bad pun, pretty revolutionary. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But, it, but at the, at the heart, it had, it, it had a good intention of trying to be something for the people. In the introduction to your Masonic Traveler book, Tim Bryce wrote that we were at the dawn of a Masonic Renaissance. And this was back in 2010 that this book came out. So, I'm going to ask you now here in 2017, have we seen that Masonic Renaissance yet? I think we have, but I think in the idealistic sense of what we would, would hoped that it would be, or maybe that that was that the spirit behind what he was thinking, we haven't. But I don't think that it's for any lack of trying. I think that it's simply, it's like bailing out a boat that you realize too late the boat is beyond the point of bailing out. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, so what I mean is that yes, it was a period of Renaissance, but at the period of Renaissance, if the change, it may have been too late to affect the change that you wanted to affect at the time, Mm -hmm. which I mean, it isn't to say that it isn't still a Renaissance, but it, it may be a Renaissance in, in certain areas of it. So in publishing in podcasts in websites, there's a profusion of them. Uh, and so in that sense, yeah, it's a renaissance. It's a very good thing. In the sense of changing ideals, I don't think that that's caught up yet. I think that that's still in the works. You know, I, I just I don't think that we, we are at a point yet where some of the ideals of, of equality and fraternity and liberty are, are, are really at, at play in the systems that we have. Uh, and in particular, what I mean is, is just the, the, the allowance of mixed gender Freemasonry, of Freemasonry still functioning at a separate level from African Americans with Prince Hall Freemasonry. Not to get into the argument of whether or not Prince Hall wants to be affiliated with quote unquote regular Freemasonry, but, but the strides to those areas seem to ebb and flow in their intensity and, and more so lately that, that it, it just seems less than more. And, and it could be climate because of climates in society, could be climates in politics and just general, uh, general zeitgeist of the age, just that it's not in a place to do it. Whereas maybe 10 years ago, I think that there was more of a feeling that that was a possibility. Yeah, you know, I've read a lot about the decline in membership throughout the past few decades. and But me personally, I, I've always been drawn to the Masonic ideologies and philosophies. You know, I have a family connection to the, to the Freemasons. My great-grandfather was a Freemason. So, you know, I've always been interested in it just for the very reasons that we've been talking about, you know, that, that I, I do think it's misunderstood, culturally speaking. It was nice to have you here to flesh out, you know, some of the history of Masonic philosophy. And, and where it stands today. I just have one more thing I want to ask you for, and that is, you know, I've always enjoyed the allegory of Hiram Abiff, and I was wondering if you could share that with us, because there's an important lesson in this story <laughs> for those who don't know, and I, th- I think it's a great way to, to wrap up this conversation. Hiram is, is obviously a central figure within, within the third degree, but the, the, as a central figure, it plays into the, the quote unquote secrets of Freemasonry as to what takes place and, and what that means to Masonry itself. So I, not to be dodgy after all this to not go into it. Certainly you could read online, uh, in a lot of different places, but, as trying to hold true to to the ideals, I I don't want to 
I, I won't give away too much in the sense of how he pertains because that would be essentially giving away the secret sauce to the to the burger. It it, fa- it factors and and in my book the the one I'm working on now with the Master Mason it factors into it uh, and there is some discussion to it, but the the core of what it represents is in the role of of the individual going through the degree assuming the persona if you will of Hiram and experiencing what he experiences and and what that means in the outcome through the blue lodge degrees so so Hiram is a central figure in freemasonry suggested symbolically to be the widow's son and the master builder the master architect of Solomon's temple so he's the one that that actually is the one leading the the work so the foreman, the overseer, if you will, the superintendent of the building. I want to say in some tradition, he he's a, a worker in brass and metals. He's the one that leads the the builders, so the stonemasons. He he's drawn the plans. So in if, in effect, the Solomon's temple is in effect the work of his hand. So the design of his plan, that that divine geometry that we talked about so elusively earlier is his handiwork in the sense of constructing this temple in in shaping it in its grounds and, and so forth. Obviously, again, what we talked about earlier, it's impossible to do a task like that by yourself, but he, he is the person who superintended the construction of the temple. Hmm. I and knew I'll, you and would, I'll leave it at yeah. that. <laughs> I was going to say, I knew you would try to get off on that one. By the way, have you seen Twin Peaks? Probably going to get eggs thrown at me for it. Way back in the day, I tried to watch it. Didn't get into it. I have not tried to watch the new ones yet. I yeah. see and hear a lot of things about it. Well, I was wondering, you know, they have this idea of a white lodge and a black lodge in, in Twin Peaks, and people try to relate that back to, to Freemasonry. I was wondering if that's if that's a thing, white lodges and black lodges. Are you talking in like a philosophical sense, so like a good and bad, or is in like a skin color? Uh, I mean, because talking... the Prince Hall obviously is is an African American lodge, and mm-hmm. and not that it, there are no uh, Caucasian members to it, and vice versa. Regular Masonry, is, for the most part, uh, has no prohibition on on skin color in the lodge. Good and evil, I guess. Yeah, not so much. I mean, I mean, it's kind of an interesting concept, but. Uh, without knowing the deeper context to it, I mean, you could definitely get into some of the deeper symbolism of the, the pillars, a white pillar, black pillar, but uh, that's probably the extent of it. I, I couldn't say, I would have to see what the reference is, but I, it, it doesn't, uh, besides being an interesting or a, or a anecdotally amusing, I, I don't know if it's accurate. I just recorded an episode about Twin Peaks, the original series and the film, you know, prior to this relaunch of the show. So there's a lot of if you're interested in, you know, a kind of symbolic, allegorical mindfuck, I would revisit that show because having saw it when I was younger, I missed a lot of the symbology of the show. And when I was rewatching it to prepare for this recent podcast. A lot of things stood out, a lot of Masonic and occult references and, and symbols there. So I was just curious about that. But anyways, Greg Stewart, man, this has been a hell of a conversation. I really appreciate you taking so much time here to talk about Freemasonry and the philosophy behind it. Do tell people where they can find your work if they want more Greg Stewart. Absolutely. So so I publish and run a website, freemasoninformation.com. Uh, you can find a lot of my writings there under the the tag for Masonic Traveler. Or if the socials are more your thing, uh, these days I tend to haunt Twitter way more than I should. Uh, but I'm on Twitter under Masonic Traveler, which should be fairly easy to find. I don't do Facebook as much anymore, pretty much not at all, uh, which for other reasons that I'll, I, I'd be happy to talk about another time that have to do with privacy and and information collection. And I also have started making the last couple of years videos for YouTube and, and exploring that. So uh, you can find me on all those. If you're interested, just hit me up on Twitter. I'd love to chat and tell me how wrong I am on stuff or how right <laughs> I am on others. 
<laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, yeah, I've really enjoyed the chat, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon about anything because uh, I really, really do admire your stance and your your own personal philosophy on these sorts of things. So, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm, I'm really grateful for you uh, asking me to do it. I appreciate it a lot. It was a lot of fun. I, I haven't done a podcast in a long time, so. Hell to the yes, Greg Stewart coming through in the clutch to help deliver our longest transmission to date. My thanks again to him for sticking around so long. I would absolutely recommend giving his work a good once over at the least. Both his website and his books are linked in the show notes. And if two plus hours of Greg Stewart wasn't enough, stay tuned over the next couple weeks because Greg and I actually spoke for about 40 or 45 minutes the night before we recorded this conversation you just heard. So be on the lookout for a few extra minutes from us in the near future. And what more can you really add to a conversation like this? I guess my biggest takeaway was if you follow pop culture or are privy to any sort of conspiracy theories, the Freemasons are a, a controversial and often demonized group linked to all sorts of nefariousness. And personally, I'd have to ask why, because if these connections that Greg outlines to Hermeticism, Gnosticism, and other esoteric and occult teachings, if these do connect to the original spirit of Freemasonry, I can see why the group would be demonized in pop culture. Empire is not too fond of teaching and preaching self-empowerment to the masses. Of course, I can't discount the notion that perhaps one bad apple at the top of the pyramid may spoil the infrastructure below it as well. Regardless, if you're delivering a positive message, I'm gonna listen. We all should. We shouldn't get sucked into this whole, oh, this person's affiliated with this group so they must be spreading lies and drinking baby's blood. I mean, come on. Judge not, lest ye be judged, as they used to say on the streets of Sodom and Gomorrah. Anyway, I did want to apologize again for the quality there from Greg's end. His voice personally sounded great, but that microphone was a pain in the ass from time to time. He messed with it multiple times and we couldn't figure it out, and I guess we could have switched to the phone, but that's not always the best quality either. Honestly, I need a better, more advanced software solution. I'm using a free program to record this and would love to upgrade to something more professional and more dynamic. I'd also like to upgrade my own hardware, so if you can spare a shekel or two, as my contemporary Miguel Connor would say over at Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio, please do consider supporting the show by visiting oculturepodcast.com slash support. One-time donations are accepted through PayPal, as well as recurring monthly donations. A few different options there. And if you have any Bitcoin you want to part with, you can send that on over our way too. And speaking of donations... Huge thank you to Michael Kovacic. Michael has now moved beyond this realm of human incarnation and has become a truly enlightened being because he's now contributing to the show at the Ascended Master level, $13.13 a month. Much appreciated, my man. And you know, I'm not selling Gatorade here, but everyone should strive to be like Mike. Also, some quick news on the Patreon campaign that I've mentioned a couple times already. I've begun to flesh that out with ideas for rewards and bonus content. It's really cool so far, I think, because I'm trying to pull in stuff that utilizes the work and talents of people I've come to know through this podcast and other podcasts, because I want to make something truly unique for the supporters of this show. Of course, nothing's final yet, but to this point, I'm pretty excited about that. Still a few months away, at least, because there's a lot of details to work through and iron out, and unfortunately, as of right now, I'm just a one-man gang here. What I also am is getting the hell out of here for right now. Thank you for sticking around this long. You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
Please rewind this cassette.